I promise you this. I will give you the best criminal defense that money can buy. Good morning. Can you state your full name and date of birth for the record for me? Sarah Boone, 101077. Ms. Boone is seated at council's table wearing a dark gray suit jacket and a maroon blouse. She is in custody. However, she's not any restraint, in, in any restraints, so we will be continuing to stand as our jury enters and exits. Uh, are we ready to bring in our panel? Yes. Okay. Yes. All right, very good. Let's go ahead and stand and bring in our panel. All right, everyone can be seated. Members of the jury, good morning. Welcome back to 12 Alpha of the Orange County Courthouse. I hope you had a great evening. Mr. Owens, you may proceed, sir. At this time, the defense calls the deputy, we're mayor, Delgado. Good morning. You can be seated, and can you please state and spell your name for the record for me? Yes, sir. My name is Jessica, first name Jessica, J-E-S-S-I-C-A. First last name is Ramirez, R-A-M-I-R-E-Z. Second last name is Delgado, D-E-L-G-A-D-O. Thank you, ma'am. You may inquire, sir. Good morning, ma'am. Good morning, sir. Ma'am, how are you employed? I am a reserve deputy with the Orange County Sheriff's Office. And how long have you been employed with the Sheriff's Office? Seven years. Uh, back on July the 25th of 2018, how were you employed at that time? I was a full-time reserve, uh, full-time deputy sheriff of the agency. On that date, ma'am, did you have the occasion uh, due to your duties to report or to go to... 4748 Frank Slane, apartment number three. Yes, sir. Uh, do you recall what you were going there for? The yes, sir. I was a backup deputy for a involving a male kicking a female in the face. So it was, it came out as a domestic call. Was it another officer who also responded? Yes, sir. He was the primary. Ma'am, while you were there, did you have contact with Sarah Boone? Yes, sir. While having contact with Ms. Boone, were you able to observe any injuries? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. She had swelling and bruising in her right eye. Ma'am, were you able to make contact with uh, Mr. George Torres? Yes, sir. Were you able to notice any injuries on his person? Yes, sir. He had red markings and some abrasions around his neck. Ma'am, at a certain point in time, uh, did you place Ms. Boone under arrest? Yes, sir. I detained her place her in my vehicle. Ma'am, at that time, do you recall or remember Miss Boone asking you, why am I in trouble? Yes, sir. And without saying what you said, but did you, did you respond to her? Yes, sir. After that, ma'am, do you remember Miss Boone asking you why? Because I fucking fought back. Yes, sir. No further questions. Thank you. Any cross-examination? During the course of your investigation, you or the other responding deputies spoke to Mr. Torres as well? Yes, sir. After concluding all of your investigation, which involved talking to both Mr. Torres and to Ms. Boone and making your observations of the two of them, um, did you all make final decisions about how to handle your investigation? The other deputy, which at the time was Deputy Zito, was the one that made that determination. Okay. But I'm... Collectively, what you all looked at was statements from Ms. Boone and Mr. Torres, correct? Yes, sir. And your physical observations of both persons? Yes. yes. And then whatever else you may have observed on scene? Yes, sir. And you take into account uh, people's demeanor when they are giving you statements when assessing uh, their credibility? Yes, sir. No other questions. Any redirect examination? No, Your Honor. Can this witness be released? Yes, sure. Yes. All right, thank you. Thank you. Defense, call your next witness. At this time, the defense calls Deputy John Alden. Sir, good morning. Can you state and spell your name for the record? John Alden, J O H N A L D E N. All right, thank you, sir. You may be seated. Mr. Henderson, you may inquire. Good morning, sir. Good morning. How are you employed? I'm employed with the Orange County Sheriff's Office as a corporal. Back on August the 28th of 2019, how were you employed? I was a deputy in the Uniform Patrol Division in Sector 2. 
as a part of your job duties that day, did you have the occasion to respond to 4748 France Lane, number three? Yes. Uh, what was the purpose? Uh, there ended up being a battery call. Sir, were you the lead officer on this case? Yes. Were there any other backup officers there with you? I believe so. Sir, on that date, August the 28th of 2019, did you come in contact with Sarah Boone? Yes. Uh, sir, on that date, did you observe any injuries on Sarah Boone? Uh, I observed redness on the left side of her neck and what to be an old injury to her right eye. Sir, on August 28th of 2019, did you come in contact with George Torres? Yes. Did you notice any injuries on Mr. Torres? Yes, he had some redness on his, by his left eye. Sir, on that day, was Mr. Torres placed under arrest? Yes. Thank you. I have no further questions. Any cross-examination? Yes. Is it fair to say that Mr. Torres had quite a few marks on him? Uh, from my report, I remember marking the left, by redness by his left eye. And did you have a body-worn camera activated when you responded to this call? Uh, I believe so. So that would be the best evidence of both video and audio as to what occurred while you were on scene. It would, especially since this happened four years or five years ago now. And uh, did Mr. Torres refuse to say what happened that day? He did. Based on the conclusion of your investigation, uh, which involved talking to Spoon and attempting to talk to Mr. Torres, as well as your visual observations of both them and the scene, is that how you all reach your conclusions? Yes. Other questions? Any redirect? No, Your Honor. Can this witness be released? Yes, Your Honor. Mr. Jay? Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Defense, you can call your next witness. Judge, at this time, the defense calls uh, Deputy Costler. Or detective, excuse me. So they've called the detective back up onto the stand to have an intense rematch with Blacklock. Good morning, ma'am. Good morning. In relation to this case, on <clears throat> February the 26th, of 2020, did you have the occasion to interview Abraham Marino? Yes, I did. Was that interview recorded, ma'am? Yes, it was. You remember as part of that interview that Mr. Marino tell you that he had had contact with Sarah Boone on February the 24th of 2020? Are you asking the night of the incident when police were called out? Yes, the next morning. The, the day that we were called? That you were called out. Okay. So, yes, he did have contact with her, um, but it wasn't in the morning. It was while we were there. Yes. What time did you get there? That's probably what's wrong. <laughs> um, I got there around uh, 14, 20 hours, which would be 2.20 in the afternoon. So the afternoon on the 24th? No, it was later. I believe I was doing paperwork in my vehicle. So it would have been at some point during the investigation, but it wasn't, I didn't notice him until, I'm not sure if I noticed him until before or after Sarah was interviewed. All right, but to his interview part, the interview, did he tell you in the interview that he had had contact with Miss Boone on that day? Yes, he did. Did he tell you at that time that Miss Boone had made a statement to him? Yes, yes, he did. Do you re remember what that statement was? I don't wish to quote what he stated. I don't know the exact verbiage, um, but he basically replayed what I'm not sure if he replayed what exactly occurred that day, um, but I do know he mentioned something about she mentioned being dragged down the stairs a couple days prior. Did he say to you during that interview that Sarah Boone told us that a couple of days ago they had gotten into a fight where he grabbed her by her hair and drug her down the steps? I would assume that he's reading my report, and that does sound similar to what my report should say. So this statement was given on the 27th. 
of February. I'm sorry, the 26th of February. Would yes. you agree with that? Yes, I would. Okay. The contact and the statement that Ms. Boone made uh, to Mr. Moreno was on the 24th of February. Is that correct? Repeat the question. I'm sorry. When Mr. Moreno was saying that Ms. Boone came up to him and made this statement that we just talked about? Yes. That was on February the 24th. Is that correct? That is correct. So when she said a couple of days ago, that would have brought it back to February the 22nd. Is that correct? Potentially, yes. Ma'am, doing that interview with you, did Mr. Moreno ever indicate to you that when he had contact with Ms. Boone on the 24th, that Sarah Boone told him what happened was an accident? Did, and did he say that Sarah Boone stated that she was teaching him a lesson and things got out of hand and that she fell asleep? I don't recall the entirety of that being accurate. Yeah, I don't recall the entirety of what he just said being accurate. Do you remember him saying that at all? He did say that she had, um, I believe he said on the recording, passed out. So that's why like part of the statements might be accurate, but... Ma'am, would it refresh your memory if you were to see the recorded statement? His recorded statement? Yes. The transcription? Yes. Sure. Yeah. Great. Now take your time. <clears throat> okay. Ready to slide me. Okay. Okay. So, um, like I had stated, there were certain things that I thought was accurate from your statement. He stated... I don't really, do I just read exactly what it says? Do you need like the number next to it or anything? Yes, I have no problem with you reading what he said. Okay. Then she. Approach. Ma'am, you cannot read the statement at this time. Okay. Thank you. You may continue, Mr. Henderson. Ma'am, anywhere in that interview, do you see reference to this statement that Sarah stated that she was teaching him a lesson and things got out of hand and that she fell asleep? No to the two parts, the first two parts of your question. Um, I heard passed out the first time you asked me this question, and that's why I said that part of it was accurate, because it, he did say that she passed out in his statement. That was what Sarah told him. Okay, did she say she was teaching a, him a lesson? Is that in there? No. And things got out of hand. Is that in there? No, I don't recall that. And again, ma'am, this interview was on February the 26th of 2020. Is that correct? Yes, it was. Thank you. I have no further questions. Any cross-examination? No further questions, Your Honor. All right. Thank you. Can this witness be released? Yes, Your Honor. State? Yes, Your Honor. All right. Thank you. Defense? Call the next witness. Your Honor, this time the defense will call Dr. Michael Brandon. Right. Very good. I do. Dr. Good morning. Good morning. Could you state and spell your name for the record for us? Um, Michael Brandon. B R A N N O N. Thank you. Counselor, you may inquire. Dr. Brandon, good morning. Good morning. Can you describe the classic system or systemology uh, wherein an individual might necessarily uh, suffer and then exhibit symptoms of battered women's syndrome? Yes. Uh, so. Battered spouse syndrome is uh, a woman, usually a woman's response, doesn't have to be, but that's a classic historical research into how women respond in situations in which there's intimate partner violence when they've been the victim of violence. Now we know, of course, in other kinds of relationships, men can be a victim of it as well, or as, whether it's a heterosexual or homosexual relationship, that both men and women can be victims. But we still know the majority of those individuals that are diagnosed with that condition or given that condition, classified with that condition, are women. We do know that it's a, a reaction, um, a strategy that's developed by the person who's being abused to someone who's abusing them in an intimate partner situation. And essentially what they're doing is they're, they've made a determination that <clears throat> they can't effectively escape from the abuse. They can't just leave for some reason. They feel in danger or they've been threatened if they leave that something bad will happen to them. So it's a cognitive or thinking strategy on the part of the person being abused that I have to develop some coping skills or ways of protecting myself and protecting myself or maybe even loved ones as well 
from some form of imminent violence or danger or lethality. Something bad will happen to me if I don't develop a way of handling this abuse, this constant abuse that's coming towards me. So the battered wife syndrome is really a way of thinking. It's a psychological change that happens with a victim in terms of the way they cope and strategize to stay safe for themselves and other loved ones as well, oftentimes. I'm going to ask a really silly question, if I may, doctor. Um, I don't know if you've noticed a bruise across the bridge of my nose this morning. I did see that when I came in. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, this weekend... Um, Oops, Hypothetic sorry. hypothetically, if an individual was digging around in the garbage, the lid fell down and cut his nose, the bridge of his nose wide open, would you as a forensic psychologist anticipate, or a psychologist in general, anticipate that there might be a physical or a psychological reaction or response to that degree of trauma? So I, I don't know if it would be trauma or not. It could be, depending on the degree of the injury and the pain and things like that. But certainly you would view you'd view that garbage can differently as you approached it. Um, so it, it changes your psychology or the way that you look at that particular situation or that particular object. Um, so by viewing it differently, you may engage in different behaviors. You may approach it differently. You may have somebody else approach it. You may approach it with both hands up. So it changes your behavior and your thinking about that garbage can. Does that also apply to <clears throat> interpersonal relationships? So it certainly can. Um, no two people always react the same way to every situation. Trauma, one person's trauma is not a trauma to another person. But for people who do develop battered spouse syndrome, um, they do begin to change the way they view the persons who's abusing them and what they have to do in order to maintain either their life or their safety, their physical safety in terms of their behavior and interactions with that person. Now, is there a specific set of criteria that a psychologist, forensic psychologist, would necessarily rely upon in attempting to make uh, a diagnosis or an assessment of battered women syndrome? Yes, sir. And what are those criteria? Well, you'd want to see one if something, some type of abuse has occurred. That abuse can be physical, it can be sexual, um, it can be emotional, or it can just be the threat of abuse or bad things that's going to happen to you. So there has to be something bad that's happened or that's threatened to be happening over a period of time. So abuse has to be present in order for this to be underway. Without abuse, there's no battered wife syndrome. But that's not enough. Um, there also has to be what's called coercive control. Coercive control is really keeping the person's social interactions, you know, overseen on a regular basis, controlling money, controlling uh, preferences, even TV preferences sometimes, social media, looking at social media that the person is accessing or looking at, who they're talking to on Facebook, who they're texting. So it's a combination of abuse and coercive control that results in a person feeling victimized, but that's still not enough. Um, that person then has to feel like they can't escape from that. Uh, they've either been told, if you leave me, you're going to die or a family member is going to be harmed, um, your children, your mother, whatever it might be. And as a result of that, they develop strategies to cope with that, acquiescing, pleasing, doing anything they're asked to do, demeaning themselves, allowing themselves to be controlled. Um, all of the things that would fend off, if you will, some abuse or attack or threat to them or someone who surrounds them. So those would be the components that you would need to have and that dance continues to go on usually repeatedly throughout the course of that relationship. So I think what you're describing is, mm -hmm. in a sense, a subjective nature to uh, the syndrome that's being described. It, it's both objective and subjective. So objective in terms of the facts, like what's really happening. A person's being abused, they're being told certain things, there's control over them. But then a subjective part is the person's interpretation of that, their perception of that. So there's really both going on, and they have to kind of work together in order for this syndrome to be formalized and properly diagnosed. You indicated that there sometimes may be some defense mechanisms that are, or strategies that are devised by the battered individual, the abused individual. Yes, sir. In your experience and your training, uh, do controlled substances, alcohol, um, drugs, frequently appear in your analysis? Versus uh, yes. And the way they appear is they can appear either from the abuser or the abused or both. 
Um, what can happen from the abuser standpoint is they may only be abusive or the abuse may become worse if they abuse substances. From the abused standpoint, it may be self-medication. It may be a way of coping with the anxiety that there's going to be something bad that potentially could happen to them or somebody else. It's, it's kind of a way of dealing with walking on the eggshells. Um, so if I use substances, that can deaden the pain, if you will, for me or help me to forget about it. So it's oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes part of either the abuser's behavior or the abused behavior. In your experience, mm -hmm. do they, on occasion, uh, actually defend the individual that is abusing them? That's a very frequent part um, of this syndrome. Not always, but it's very frequent. It's, it's why interviewing them becomes difficult sometimes because they're used to explaining away their behavior, the abuser's behavior, my black eye, my missing tooth, um, his screaming and yelling in the background while I'm talking to mom on the phone. So they're used to making excuses for, it's part of the coping strategy, trying to explain away this behavior. He's had a bad day. Um, she's, you know, really upset about something else that's going on. She's really never like this at any other time. So defending that person is, are oftentimes a part of the battered spouse syndrome and getting the person who's been abused to get them to stop defending them so they can talk about the actual abuse becomes a challenge. The DSM makes reference on occasion to rule out, uh, assume for the diagnosis that's being applied. What is a rule out? A rule out in our parlance says that we should consider these things before we look at other diagnoses. So. For instance, if we're going to consider schizophrenia, we should rule out substance abuse first because oftentimes some drugs can create hallucinations and delusions and psychotic symptoms. So there's always rule out, just like there are for medical conditions. So look for this before you consider this is really what a rule out is. Are there specific rule outs for battered women syndrome or PTSD? Sure. So there's rule outs for everything because you're, you're considering a number of different conditions before you make a differential diagnosis or you pick that's the one that I think best fits this person. So, yes, there's rule outs for both of those. For my sake, what is a differential diagnosis? Uh, that's how you, you decide which ones, whether it's your medical doctor, your psychologist, whoever. It's how they pick the right diagnosis. So you're going through kind of a card catalog in your head and you're saying, all right, there's symptoms of this, but that's also consistent with symptoms of that. So is it schizophrenia? Is it bipolar disorder? Now I have to ask more questions. It's a decision tree. And that decision tree helps you to inform the person and either make a diagnosis in a legal setting or help to treat them clinically. If the individual, the psychologist who's doing the evaluation, identifies the presence of certain rule outs of uh, what is their response professionally to those rule outs in establishing or assessing the patient? You have to go down a decision tree. Um, and we all kind of do decision trees in our mind every day about what we should do or shouldn't do in certain situations. It happens automatically. It's more structured when you're doing it professionally. So if you have a concern about substances, then you would kind of take that track and you'd have to ask a lot of questions in that area. Um, so you'd want to know what kind of substances, how often are they using those substances, what kind of effect have those substances had on them before. I just picked one of many possible rule outs there. But every one of them you'd have to explore or ask additional questions because, of course, you want to come up with the wrong diagnosis because in a legal setting that leads you to a bad opinion. In a clinical setting, it leads to bad treatment. Now, I want to go back just a second. We talked about the subjective nature of the uh, the abused individual's understanding of what's happening. Uh, does this subjective or, or does the experience that they have suffered uh, result in, on occasion, their experiencing or, or their anticipating or assuming or imagining a threat that others may not? Yes, sir. Yes. Objection is sustained. Doctor, from what you described this morning, uh, I think we're talking about a complex and sophisticated process uh, for assessing and diagnosing PTSD, uh, battered women, the matters that you described. Is that a fair statement? Yes, sir. In this instance, uh, this particular matter regarding the state versus Sarah Boone, uh, were you approached about the possibility of doing an assessment 
as to Sarah Boone. Okay. Uh, approach. Objection sustained. Doctor, when you are retained to do an evaluation in these matters, what is your practice in regards to the assessment proceedings, the assessment efforts? Well, I first want to know what type of an assessment that, that it is, um, because there's different methods of approach that you'd use to analyze and be able to give an opinion on whatever questions being asked of you. So the very first goal for me as a forensic psychologist is to isolate what the question is. Um, so what are they asking me to do? Because I want to know, A, can I do that? Am I qualified to do that? Or should I refer that to somebody else? Or B, is that something I'm going to have enough uh, time to do and enough resources to do? Then the next thing I would do is start asking questions about specifically what you already have or what can you get to help me answer this question. So right away, I'd start to find out what's available. As forensic psychologists, we're supposed to do comprehensive evaluations of whatever the legal issue or question is. And it's supposed to rely on multiple sources of information. So depending again upon the question, I'm trying to then define early on what are those multiple pieces of information I'm going to need to help to try to give an opinion and an educated opinion about that matter. Have you done an assessment in this particular case? No, sir. Can you tell us very briefly whether that was your decision? Objection, relevance. Okay, Approach. fine. That's fine. Let's okay. move on. Objection sustained. In your experience, doctor. Thank you very much. Can battered women's syndrome. Uh, rear its ugly head, for instance, when there are threats to other members of the family, uh, two-legged or four? So, yes, sir, it's very common um, that it's not just the person. It increases the terror from someone who's doing the abuse to mention other family members that they might also suffer abuse. So whether it's emotional or physical, those type of things are very common. Not always, but it's very common in the course of domestic violence cases or intimate partner violence cases. And that fear uh, that's developed by the abused individual uh, may exist contemporaneously with other issues, alcoholism, uh, schizophrenia, and, and the like. Is that correct? Yes, sir. They can all be combined together. Um, and, and certainly that increases if there's other family members that are threatened or live in the same home or close by. That can increase the terror. The purpose of that is to increase control to make sure the abuser has more control over the person who's being abused. In doing an assessment, doctor, would, do you look at outside materials? Yes, or always. And what kind of outside materials do you necessarily review in order to make this assessment? Uh, specifically to battered woman syndrome? Yes, yes sir. So specific to this, you, you'd want to look at a lot of different sources of information because you're trying to, A, make a diagnosis if there's a trauma-related disorder, but you're also trying to figure out if there's the other elements necessary to make the diagnosis as well, like abuse that's been chronic over a period of time and that the person feels they can't leave that situation and if other people have been threatened. So you'd want to know things like not only what the facts are of the particular incident, usually some crime that's been committed, but you'd want to know the history of those behaviors. Has anyone else seen those? Are there people you can talk to? You know, friends, neighbors, bosses, anybody who's seen or heard of this abuse before. Have there been medical visits where the person has actually been damaged and shown up, made some other excuse, they slipped or fell or whatever it might be? You'd want to do psychological testing as a forensic psychologist because we have very good tests that help us to determine whether someone's suffering from a trauma-based disorder or not. You'd want to know if the person um, who'd been accused of the crime for this type of evaluation made any statements to the police. Um, if they did, you'd want to hear that statement. Or has there been a 911 call um, if, or calls? If that's happened, you'd want to hear that too. So any evidence you could collect, and these are some of those questions I was talking to you about before, you'd want to ask the person who's trying to hire you in the beginning, well, tell me what you have, because you'd want to see whether or not you're going to be able to make this analysis or not. So it's not good enough just to talk to the person, because that's just one form of information. It's almost like being a behavioral detective, if you will, as a forensic psychologist, because we're trying to get as much evidence wrapping around our interview with the person as possible to be able to guide our questions, but inform us and see whether there's what we call convergent validity. It's a fancy way of saying, does everything agree with each other? Does everything connect in a way that it all sort of makes sense? 
or these strange conflicting pieces of evidence that we need to explain away or it just doesn't fit the criteria. So it's a rather comprehensive and complex evaluation has to be conducted to come up with this. And the final piece I'd say about it is that um, because oftentimes the abused person is defend, defending still the person that they've oftentimes committed a crime against, it, it takes a bit of time to get to where you need to go. With all victims of trauma, whether you're talking about situations where you're doing therapy or you're doing an analysis in this type of setting, a, a criminal setting, it usually takes some time to break through that and get them to trust you to talk about the trauma, but to stop defending the person and talk about the abuse and how they felt about the abuse. Your goal, if you will, is to be able to see what's happening in that situation through the abused person's eyes. If you look at it through your eyes, um, often it doesn't seem to make sense. But if you look at it through their eyes, if it meets the criteria for a battered spouse, then you can better understand their world and what they're dealing with. And real briefly, some of the things that you are evaluating when you uh, examine, particularly the individual themselves, uh, you're looking for anxiety and or fear? Yes. Uh, low self-esteem? Yes. Are you looking for depression? Yes. Uh, are you looking for uh, any form of social or interpersonal withdrawal? Uh, withdrawal, especially if it's forced withdrawal, controlled withdrawal, if there's consequences to socializing with my family, my friends, calling them on the phone, texting them. So especially in that context. Stockholm syndrome. Uh, sure, that can be part of it. Uh, what is Stockholm syndrome? A little briefly. So it's really adapting to someone who's uh, captive or taking over a person, controlling their life, sort of adapting to that situation. Um, the famous model of that would be Many, many decades ago, a woman called Patty Hearst, who was kidnapped, but it's taking on the beliefs and taking on an acceptance, if you will, of a kind of a captive situation. And in these situations with women who have been abused who meet the criteria um, for battered spouse syndrome, they oftentimes adapt, defend, and take on in an acquiescent way that this is okay and I'm part of this situation as opposed to opposed to the situation. Well, this syndrome uh, exhibit itself in physical attributes? It, it can, um, at times, even physical illness at times. Uh, inability to sleep, inability to keep food down, and those type of things. Sure. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, would that individual potentially experience hypervigilance? Uh, well, that's a, a large part of it, of any trauma-based disorder is hypervigilance. What changes when you've been traumatized, any kind of trauma, not just abuse, but what changes is your perception of danger. So whether it's the lid of the garbage can hitting you on your nose um, or whether it's someone being abusive towards you, those situations change your perception of danger. So you no longer see that object or that person in the same way. You have a, a foreboding sense of danger could occur. Mm -hmm. So other people may not perceive it with that person. He's so nice at work or he's nice in these other settings or he's so great on the softball field, but at home he's different. So that person who's being abused, their perception changes. Does that include denial? It could do, include denial, and oftentimes that's part of the explanation. The defensiveness of that person is the denial of how bad things are that are going on. Look, man, I'm not getting in the suitcase, all right? There's obviously no shortage of shots I could take at this battered wife defense, but I'll just say this. Do you really expect me to believe that this woman who spent the past four and a half years firing attorneys and pitching a huge fit is actually willing to let herself be controlled? She's driving the entire defense case from the back seat. Don't drink the Sarah Boone Kool-Aid. Any cross-examination? Yes, sir. Good morning, doctor. Good morning. Nice to see you in person. Good to see you again. So there's a subjective component to trauma, <clears throat> what I understand you're saying, correct? Always. Yes, sir. And so, hypothetically, a couple could be in a three-and-a-half-year relationship with physical violence, emotional violence, even sexual violence, but either or both of those partners may or may not believe that as a traumatic experience for him or herself, correct? Yes, sir. People mistake the stimulus about what happens as the trauma. The, the trauma is really the reaction to it. So bad things that happen, people don't always react in the same way to them. So, yes, sir, that's correct. So, for instance, a homicide detective or a homicide prosecutor may go out to a scene and say, see a freshly dead body, and their perception of that 
environmental stimulus may be very different from somebody who works at Dunkin' Donuts and, and just gives us muffins in the morning coming across a dead body. Is that fair? Yes, sir. That homicide detective may be able to go eat lunch right after it. And the other person who works at the, the donut uh, restaurant may not be able to eat for a couple of days as a result. So, yes, perception is a, a big part of how trauma occurs. And I understand your answers today. Um, and I'm not saying that they were different the other day. Um, but I understand you to say that it's very important to do a comprehensive evaluation um, to get the full picture of what is going on in uh, the perceived uh, battered spouse's um, mind. You correct? Are, we, we yes. The objection is overruled. So we've been talking about the importance of doing a comprehensive evaluation with as many collateral sources as one could possibly have uh, when making an assessment about the battered spouse syndrome, correct? Yes, sir. Relevant piece of information. Yes, sir. And would you agree that obviously the person who uh, is accused of committing a crime, uh, there are credibility issues that you do need to uh, care for when relying upon that person's history provided about the events leading to that and the past events describing the relationship with the intimate partner? Yes, sir. In every forensic evaluation, that's the case. Is this particularly important if there's a comorbidity with an alcohol abuse disorder? Yes. And can you tell the jury what alco alcohol abuse disorder means in the DSM-5-TR? Sure. It's the biggest part of it is it's not just the use of alcohol, it's impairment that happens as a result. So it's the excessive use of alcohol, but that could mean something different, just like the excessive use of marijuana might mean. But it's the use of alcohol to the degree that it impairs or infects a person's life. And with that may come a lot of other things like deceitfulness or aggression or um, uh, unreliability, um, sleep or somatic problems, difficulties. So, but the important thing to remember there is that it's the use of a substance that impairs or affects a person's life. If there is alcohol involved in the histories being given about either the event in question or any preceding events, um, must the evaluator take that into account when evaluating the memories and perceptions of the person giving them that history? Uh, yes. So in introducing that new topic about memory, we know that substances can interfere and impair memory. So as a result of that, you'd want to know what they were using, how close it was. If you're talking about a particular event, like a crime, you'd want to know if there was substance usage. And if so, what the person's memory functioning was, and does that match up with other sources of information about what those events were? Are you familiar with the narcissistic personality disorder? Yes, sir, of course. Is that something recognized in the DSM-5 TR? Yes, sir. And can you tell us whether or not if a person who is giving a history, um, whether it's the patient slash client or whatnot, has traits, um, perhaps not a diagnosis, but even just traits of the narcissistic personality disorder, is that something the evaluator should account for in evaluating the credibility of the history given? Yes. And why is that? Well, because all forms of disorders or conditions or just traits may lead to inaccurate information, either not purposely or purposely. They may be deceptive. So certain personality disorders or traits can lead to deception or inappropriate or inaccurate information. That's why you need more than one source of information. Does what this per is what this person is saying to me check out with other sources of information? And I don't mean to quiz you on it, but can you tell us some of the criteria for the narcissistic personality disorder? I can. Yes, sir. So it is a grandiose sense of self-worth. Um, it's the consideration of yourself over anybody else. Um, it's kind of operating your own world. So it's an inflated sense of who you are. It's a misperception of how important you are to other people and your meaning to other people. Um, it's a sense of specialness that you stand out from other people in terms of special skill or skills and that other people, if they don't recognize that, they should recognize that. So the heading, the biggest heading there is an inflated sense of self, uh, self-esteem and grandiosity. Are you familiar with an adjustment disorder diagnosis? Yes, sir. Can you, is that in the DSM-5 TR? Yes, sir. Correct. Can you tell us about that? Adjustment disorder is a person's reaction, and it could be emotional, it can be behavioral, or it can be both, to a situation that occurs. Um, you broke up with your boyfriend or girlfriend, so you're upset about that. And so as a result, you're tearful, you're anxious or nervous or worried about what may happen to you as a result of breaking up with them, um, or you behaviorally may not start not going to work um, or get into more arguments or fights um, with your children as a result. 
So it's a temporary reaction um, to a stressful situation that occurs in some individuals. If somebody is giving uh, a history and that is being used uh, to come to an evaluation uh, conclusion of battered spouse syndrome, if that person has been diagnosed with adjustment disorder predating the traumatic relationship, is that something the evaluator should take into account? You'd want to know any prior diagnosis um, because it may not necessarily be exclusionary, but it could. So adjustment disorder is a temporary reaction. You're upset in a temporary period, and most of them just go away on their own. Whereas something else like a traumatic stress disorder is long-term. It's something that a person's stuck with for a period of time that usually doesn't just go away on its own. So yes, you'd want to know that for that term I used before, that differential diagnosis. You'd want to know those things to compare and contrast them and hold them up against each other. Now, hypothetically, if somebody says things like, I'm the best thing that has ever happened to you and um, I'm the best you'll ever do, are those indications of the narcissistic personality disorder? Well, they could be. You wouldn't want just that alone. You'd want to see if that was happening in other settings. Is that happening on the job with friends, with family members? Is it showing up on psychological testing? But certainly that would be a red flag. You'd go, hmm, I want to pay more attention to that. I want to investigate that further. And is it important uh, when evaluating trauma-based disorders, because they're based on emotional reactions, to do that rule out on alcohol or drug use? Uh, certainly you'd want to do that. It's not usually disguised the trauma-based disorder. Alcohol and trauma don't, aren't usually rule outs for each other, but it could exacerbate a condition. It could make you diagnose a trauma condition when it's just an adjustment disorder. I say just, I don't mean to minimize it, but it's not as serious as a trauma-based disorder. Is it important to consider whether the abuser and or the abused mm -hmm. behave differently uh, in the absence of alcohol or drugs? Yes. Why is that? Well, because you're, you're trying to analyze a psychological condition. If as a result of drug or alcohol abuse, their behavior changes or their perceptions change, that's not a psychological condition, that's a substance abuse disorder. So that's why you'd want to know that. So if their condition remains the same, maybe it's a little worse when they're using drugs or alcohol, but it's the same perception of threat or danger, then you're going to diagnose a trauma-based disorder. If not, then you're going to diagnose a substance abuse disorder. You can have both but you'd want to rule one out as opposed to the other. And are you familiar with the classic three-step <clears throat> cycle of battered spouse uh, syndrome or domestic violence? Yes, sir, I am. Can you explain that to the jury? Sure. So there is a cycle of violence that was first developed by a woman in the 70s called uh, Lenore Walker, Dr. Lenore Walker. She's a psychologist who's usually credited with developing the whole theory of battered spouse syndrome. And in the classic model, which we know oftentimes happens, not every time, but in the classic model, there's a period of, of tension buildup where things are happening, little arguments are happening, there's bickering back and forth, there may be some threats or some loud voices back and forth, but it's all things that are leading up to a possible violent episode. Then there's the episode that happens itself, the violent episode. It could be verbal, sexual, physical, um, but there's the violent incident that occurs. And then after that violent episode occurs, there's a honeymoon phase where the person who's done the abuse, they're apologizing, taking that person who was abused out to dinner, buying them things, saying nice things to them, complimenting them to sort of make up for the abuse. And it's kind of a, it's called the cycle of violence. And the reason why is it, it tends to repeat itself in a lot of these situations of battered spouse syndrome where you see this repeating itself over and over and over again. So people are kind of stuck in these revolving doors in their relationship. And can one cycle be enough to traumatize a person? Yes. Does this trauma necessarily have to be coming from a man to a woman? No. And in fact, as times have changed, language has changed. And so when we keep referring to it as battered woman syndrome in the courtroom today, what we're actually talking about now is battered spouse syndrome or even intimate partner violence. Yes, yeah, so I mean, inner partner violence can happen outside of legal settings, but it's really a kind of the, the large over grouping, if you will, to be able to talk about all of these other things that can happen as a result, like trauma based disorders and battered spouse syndrome. Um, and you're right. Um, the later research has kind of pulled us away from thinking this only happens to women in heterosexual relationships. We know now there's all sorts of derivations and that men can be suffer also from battered, white, uh, battered spouse syndrome, battered person syndrome, um, homosexual couples. So we, we know it goes around to everybody, but still women are more often diagnosed with battered spouse syndrome than anybody else. Does the trauma have to come in the form of physical violence? No, sir.
Does it have to come in the form of sexual violence? No, sir. Can it come in the form of emotional or mental violence? Yes, sir. And would examples of that include such as running the partner down and telling them that they're no good and, you know, just general insulting and lowering their value? It could. Remember, that's the stimulus. So it would depend on how the person who's receiving that responds to it as to whether or not it becomes traumatic. But yes, sir, that would be the first red flag you'd want to investigate. And you mentioned isolation before. So if somebody in a hypothetical intimate partner setting is trying to isolate <clears throat> the partner from his or her family members or friends or coworkers, can that be, and I'm not saying necessarily, can that be indications of uh, intimate partner violence that could lead to battered spouse syndrome? So sure, that'd be an example of course of control. So if a person was doing that, that's consistent with that, that, that classification of battered person syndrome, yes. And hypothetically, Controlling another person, your the intimate partner's personal property or effects, such as a birth certificate or identification papers, um, can that be indication of emotional trauma towards the partner who, who is lacking the control over those identification papers? So that's a stimulus that could result, depending on how the person subjectively perceives it, in some trauma. So yes, all of the things that you mentioned could be stimulus, if you will, that a person could perceive as traumatic. And hypothetically, if one partner, A, gives partner B a gift, such as a bicycle, but partner A continues to maintain that the bicycle is his or hers because he or she bought it, even though it was a gift to B, can that be a, a form of emotional abuse towards B? Sure, it sounds like control, but I, I guess you could interpret it as emotional abuse too, but um, it sounds more like a, a control mechanism that'd be consistent. And I'm not suggesting that it's legally or morally okay. But when one intimate partner uh, does these hypothetical emotional things, non-physical violent things to partner B, if partner B has poor personal skills and coping skills and may be consuming alcohol, is it unreasonable or unfathomable to uh, hear that partner B res responded with physical violence to partner Jack, B? Jack, you're assuming facts, not in evidence. Sustained. Yes. After hearing argument of counsel, the objection is overruled. So may respond to that? If you remember the question, do. please go ahead. Um, so it would increase the probability of physical violence. So if those things, in fact, were perceived as threatening or abusive in any way or insulting to the uh, person who they were directed towards, it would increase the probability of physical violence. And then again, the perceptions are all in the eye of the beholder, whether um, emotional things that are said to one another or physical things are done to one another, whether the recipient of that behavior views it as trauma is a subjective decision by that person, right? Yes, it's a, it, the perception is the impact. So that's how you would know that. It's just, you know, water off a duck's back or is it something that kind of stucks with, sticks with me and I think about it all the time. Now, you mentioned earlier um, anxiety, low self-esteem and depression can all be components of battered spouse syndrome, correct? Correct. Is it important as the evaluator to rule out whether or not these conditions predated the violent or abusive relationship? Yes. Why is that? Well, because where things start is important diagnostically. So if all of those things were in place, all of the symptoms that were just mentioned are in place, then you wouldn't attribute those to the abuse. You'd say those things were pre-existing. Now, abuse could make it worse. But in terms of your diagnosis, you need to know where things started. So if things, if those symptoms didn't start at the time where there was abuse that was alleged to have occurred, then it's unlikely that it's attributed to that abuse. And independent of any narcissistic personality uh, disorder traits, would you agree that anybody in a, in a certain legal setting has a motivation to present themselves in a certain way? Uh, yes, to do impression management, either depending on the outcome. So if there, there's punitive sanctions, they may lie to make themselves look worse. Or as a result, if they're in other settings, like divorce settings, they may lie to make themselves look better. So there's always some impression management you have to kind of look through in your evaluation. That's important for an evaluator. It should be looked at in every evaluation. Thank you. Yes, sir. Any redirect examination? In response to the state's questioning, you indicated that where an individual's credibility might be in question, there is a necessity that the individual who's making the assessment do a, a corroborate whatever they're being told. Is that correct? 
Yes, sir, in a number of different ways. We have psychological tests that assess for things called malingering or faking mental health problems or difficulties. So you'd want to do that. You'd want to look at other evidence to see if it's all consistent. So it's very important you don't just rely on self-report. It's possible that uh, an individual may exhibit one or two uh, attributes of a particular uh, DSM diagnosis, but not actually qualify because it's simply not there. Right. Sure. So sometimes like social isolation can be because we're introverted um, or it could be part of depression. So you need to kind of follow it out and see how many of the symptoms are there to see whether or not it meets the criteria. So I may exhibit one or two symptoms of narcissism, but not qualify because I don't meet all of those uh, or a significant, a significant number of the um, indicators that you would rely upon to make that diagnosis. Yes, sir. Or, or it can be situationally based, like we may display narcissistic features here um, in a courtroom, but may not do that in any other part of our life. Now, in your experience, has have you determined, learned, either through your um, studies, experience, and so on, whether or not the abusive behavior may begin uh, based upon an individual's perception of things occurring to him as a child? Or her as a child. In other words, if they if they grow up in an abusive household. Okay, I understand. Sustained. You've indicated that there are things that I think in response to the state's cross examination, uh, that there are things that may add to, uh, or may contribute to, uh, a particular psychosis or symptom. Uh, would an individual's background as a child include those type of criteria? Yes, sir. You're more vulnerable to certain psychological conditions based on your history. So if you've been uh, traumatized before or bad situations have happened to you before, if you've suffered from depression before, it makes you more vulnerable to those conditions or other conditions later on. Finally, one question or one uh, symptom that we haven't discussed, I don't think, or maybe it was discussed by the state, was learned helplessness. What is that? Learned helplessness, I've really spoken about it a little bit, but now we have the, the fancy term for it. Uh, learned, learned helplessness was really researched by someone named Seligson, a doctor named Seligson, a psychologist, research psychologist. And just real briefly, um, what it is, it's when someone kind of gives up and feels like there's nothing that they can do to change their situation. It was originally done with laboratory animals. But um, where a person really feels that no matter what strategy they've taken, like leave, stay, fight, whatever it might be, it won't work. It usually leads to depression or developments of other strategies, like I have to appease or please or make sure I do everything correctly or apologize. So it's really believing that no matter what you do, it won't be effective. Doctor, thank you for your testimony. Thank you for yes, sir. traveling up here from Miami so early in the morning. No problem at all. Thanks for the rest. Excuse me. Thank you, sir. You can be excused. Thank you, Your Honor. Defense, you may call your next witness. Judge, we would call uh, the phone, forensic phone extraction uh, officer with the uh, Orange County Sheriff's Department, Officer Wadden, to the stand. Thank you. We'll bring her in. He's clear. We'll find the best one we should get. Shall be sure the whole truth and the truth. So, what you got? Thank you. Again, your official title? Uh, Digital Forensics Examiner. And you recognize that uh, video or that CD of the video? Yes. Well, I think we kind of prepped you on it ahead of time. Uh, that was extracted from uh, the Sarah Boone phone that you were asked to extract? Yes, one of, one of the um, media files, yes. Okay, and is that video a fair and accurate depiction of uh, one of the videos that was extracted from Sarah Boone's phone? Yes. And then identification Z, defense identification, same, same type of question. You've had a chance to review that. Video and is that one of the videos that was extracted from the Sarah Lee phone? Yes. You're gonna help me take this shit out. Real shit. You're gonna help me take it out. You're gonna help me take this shit out. It's bad as I want to.
Right. Yes, understood. They're tendering, no problems. All right, thank you very much. This witness can't be released, correct? They, yes, sir. Thank you. Mr. Owens, you may call your next witness, sir. Governor, the fence call is a parole walker. Okay. Ma'am, good afternoon. Can you state and spell your name for the record, please? Walker. P E A R L. Walker W A L K E R. Thank you very much, ma'am. Mr. Beck, you may proceed. Good afternoon, Ms. Walker. Ms. Walker, do you know the defendant, Sarah Boone? Yes. yes. How do you know Ms. Boone? She lives in the same apartment building that I lived in. And can you tell us how long the two of you shared the same apartment complex, apartment buildings? About four years. And how is it that you became familiar? With Ms. Boone. My husband and I were sitting out on the porch and we see her coming with her two dogs. What trans what happened then? Then I would call her over. What you know, with her dogs. And what do you mean by call her over? When I see her walking with her dog, and I see her and I look at her and I said, Hey Sarah, how you doing? And that's it. And would she generally respond to you? Yes. Would you spend time with Ms. Boone? Would I spend time? Would you spend time speaking with Ms. Boone? Yes. Uh, how long would you speak with her? About 15 or 20 minutes. That's all. And was your husband sometimes involved in those conversations as well? He just say hi. So you and Ms. Boone were the two primary communicators? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, <laughs> In the time that you knew Ms. Boone, uh, did you witness anything about her person or her body that gave you cause for concern? Sometimes I would see it like she had been choked around her neck or her arm be hurt, hurt, have a mark on her arm. And I just asked her. And would she describe how that happened? I'll just say, I had a... Hang on, hang on. The objection is sustained. When you would ask her that, how did she appear to you uh, to respond emotionally to your, your questions about her injuries? She just say, one of them days or something. Jackson sustained. Just for the record, uh, instead of telling us what she would say, would, her, would she demonstrate any emotion on her face? Well, I would see the emotion that she was upset about something. Did you ask about her obvious, obvious upset uh, persona, uh, her upset, uh, the, the fact that she was upset? Would you ask her about that? Yeah. Well, okay, you have to, then you have to just limit your, your answer to the question. Would you ask her about that, that issue, or what, why she was upset? Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry, I just can't go beyond that. Thank you. Now, how frequently would that occur? I would say on the weekends when I see her. Was that primarily when you saw her on the weekends? Mostly I would see her walking through, going to her place, and when she... And I'm sitting on the porch, and I see her then. While you were there uh, in that apartment complex, and excuse me for getting ahead of myself, do you still live in that apartment complex? No. Oh. Uh, how long have you been gone for that, from that apartment complex? If you don't know, that's fine. Oh. <laughs> it's been a Thank you, ma'am. Um, <clears throat> during the, the occasions that you had to interact with Ms. Boone, how did she treat you? Nice lady. Overruled. Nice to me. Did she ever act uppity? Objection. Problems. Overruled. 
Did she ever treat you in an uppity manner? Which, which you mean, sir? Did she ever look down on you as a person? Oh, no. Did she ever treat you with disrespect? No. Sustained. May I approach on this, Your Honor? Yes. Objection sustained. In the time that you and Ms. Boone lived together, on occasion, did you see law enforcement arrive at the apartment complex? A couple of times. And did you ever get involved in any of their investigation? No, sir. Were you ever, I'm sorry, were you ever approached by law enforcement and asked for information, evidence, insight into uh, what might be going on? No, sir. Now, in all candor, uh, were there occasions when you believed that Sarah Boone may have been uh, under the influence of alcohol? No, I can't say. Were there, did you also observe George Torres uh, during the time that you lived together, lived there in the apartment complex? I didn't see him very much. If we sitting on a porch, that's the only time. Uh, did you know Mr. Torres very well? No. Was there an incident when you saw Ms. Boone with a black eye? Yes. Did you witness a pattern between Ms. Boone and Mr. Torres wherein you observed signs of abuse? Objection, nomination. Sustained. You testified that you saw Ms. Boone on occasion with bruises, other injuries, and a black eye. Is that correct? Is that accurate? Yes. Uh, and was there any pattern to what you observed in regards to those injuries and uh, bruises that you observed on Ms. Boone? One time I seen with a black eye and like she had been choked one time. Okay. Did Ms. Boone complain to you about those marks? Yes. Thank you, Your Honor. Nothing further. Any cross-examination? Hi, Ms. Walker. How are you? Is it fair to say you're not sure when exactly you saw any of those injuries on her, correct? Say that again? You're not exactly sure when you saw any of those injuries on her, correct? Once you come past the apartment, I'll be sitting out there. We always sit out there. Right, but we don't know if this is December or 2018 or anything well, I like that. I can't remember, sir. Okay. And is it fair to say you have no idea how she got those marks? Is that fair? Repeat that again. Do you have any idea how she got those marks? On the weekends, I, I, I see him and her go in. Okay. But you don't know who, if anybody, put those marks on her, right? Well... I just can, calls for yes or no. I can tell when they in a, must have had an argument or something. I hear the dogs barking. Okay. And you're five doors down, right? Unit eight, unit three? Yeah. Okay. No other questions. Any redirect examining? No, Your Honor. Thank you. Can this witness be released? Yes, sir. Thank you very much, ma'am. Miss Walker, the deputies are going to come get you and take you out, okay? You all done? Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much. All right. Defense, at this time, you may call your next witness. We call Dr. Julie Harper. Be swear or harm the testimony you should get. Shall be true, full of truth, and truth of what we I do. Doctor, good afternoon. Could you state and spell your name for the record for us? Dr. Julie Harper, H A R P E R. Thank you. Counselor, you may inquire. Thank you, Judge. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I think you've already stated your name, but just introduce yourself to the jury. My name is Dr. Julie Harper, and I'm a licensed psychologist. Dr. Harper, do you recognize Sarah Boone at the defense table with Tony Henderson? I do. When did you first get involved with Ms. Boone? Um, it would have been in around June of 2020. Uh, it was the first I heard of her case. And what were you asked to do? Uh, a comprehensive psychological evaluation of Ms. Boone. And did you do that in Ms. Boone's case? I did. Okay. Were you given materials to review? I was. 
Is that standard operating procedure? Yes. You assess the client individually one-on-one, -on -one, and then there are collateral evidence or material that you also consider? Yes. Can you tell the jury about that? Yes. So in forensic work, there are a variety of um, documents that are usually available in assessing a defendant. In this case, for criminal court, you would see things like witness statements. There might be body cam footage or um, just more information about the offense itself. Sometimes there's an interrogation video. Uh, so you would get kind of the legal description of the offense and, and the things that have occurred. I also will often get educational records of a person, mental health records, hospital records, things of that nature that would describe um, their biopsychosocial history to me. And you were given materials as it relates to Sarah Boone to review? Yes, I have it. How many times did you meet with Sarah Boone? Nine times. Can you tell the jury what you did as part of your evaluation of Sarah Boone? Well, we had a clinical forensic interview in which I reviewed her background history, so her early childhood. I also uh, assessed her with assessments, meaning I um, administered three psychological tests to her. I reviewed her uh, prior mental health records, her interrogation video, um, the some prior information about her legal history. So she had been previously arrested. I reviewed that as well. Uh, we had an opportunity to um, review the transcript of her interrogation video. So there were a variety of things that would be considered what I did with her. Okay. So you considered some medical records? Yes. And did you also consider some records from uh, George Torres's records? I did see his uh, hospital records. Now, do you consider in doing an assessment and forming any opinions um, an individual like Miss Boone's upbringing in terms of where they grew up and what their family environment was like? Yes, that's part of gathering their background uh, history, so biopsychosocial information. And do you did you consider Miss Boone's upbringing? In, in forming any opinions? I did. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes. So of her history, I found it uh, pertinent that she was raised with... Um, Roach, the objection is sustained. Would you have considered, um, as part of her family background, um, whether or not some of her family members had passed away early in her life? Objection. Conduit Sustained. Do you consider the entire family background and history without without going into the details of what she said or what you learned from looking at records? I'm sorry? Yes. And did you consider her relationship with her mother as part of her psychological development? Yes. Now, do you believe that Sarah Boone uh, does have some narcissistic traits? I do. Can she does she doesn't qualify or meet the criteria for that diagnosis? Does she? I did not diagnose her with that. Can you elaborate on or explain how you feel that Sarah Boone does have some narcissistic traits? Well, in meeting with her as part of the evaluation, the narcissistic traits that I identified would have to do with. Um, as she described being a straight-A student, she reiterated about her abilities, and I felt that that was evidence that she had low self-esteem, and her coping mechanism was to identify what made her stand out, and that would be consistent with a narcissistic trait. Now, uh, Dr. Brannon testified earlier today, and there was some evidence relating to when you suffer from narcissism, there's a sense of grandiosity. But is that in your, your studies, in your experience, where they require excess, admir excessive admiration and whatnot, that they, there's a reason for that? If I'm understanding your question, there's a criterion in narcissistic personality disorder, 
related to what, that. What I'm getting to is many times you may have these narcissistic traits, but really you suffer from very low self-esteem. That's the underpinning of that criterion. Would you explain that to me? Um, if I'm allowed to reference the DSM, then I can explain it best. Just don't read from it. Just All right. if, you need to review, if you need to read a paragraph and then explain it to the jury. So based on the description in the DSM, if a person's self-esteem is very fragile and they have low self-esteem, they may require more outside admiration or even appear more um, grandiose in their abilities because at root, they don't feel secure and confident. And so it's what we would call a defense. And so that criterion is actually a way that a person tries to make themselves feel better. Anything else you want to say about that? that issue? Well, you asked me about why I didn't diagnose narcissistic personality disorder. And again, from the DSM, we're to... Un are there criteria? There are criteria for each disorder. And so you, when you're assessing someone, they have to meet all those criteria for you to form that opinion that they actually suffer from that disorder? Well, the first, I guess, issue is do they have the criterion that are listed. And then the second would be, is there a different mental health disorder that would better explain the criterion that you're seeing? Uh, the criterion within the DSM overlap considerably across disorders. And so there are some helpful guidelines within the DSM to remind you of that, that you may have what's called differential diagnosis. So if you're considering one thing, that you also are directed to look at other things. So that happened in this case, in this instance, that the DSM guided me to also look at other things. But, but just for purposes, to make it clear, you did not diagnose her as with narcissism, that disorder. That's correct, because the DSM's description guided me that that would not be an appropriate uh, diagnosis. Why, why did you not diagnose Ms. Boone with a personality disorder? Well, first of all, it has to be a pervasive pattern of distorted relational abilities. So basically, if she is demonstrating in a variety of settings that she has these symptoms. And then secondarily, the uh, diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder is listed when you're considering personality disorders. The, the DSM guides you that if there are personality changes that are associated with the exposure to a trauma, then you should consider post-traumatic stress disorder and not a personality disorder. Have you diagnosed her with anything? And we'll, we'll elaborate on that, but have, through your assessment, have you diagnosed her with anything? Yes, so she has a diagnosis of uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, she has symptoms of anxiety that would be uh, consistent with post-traumatic stress disorder. So that is an anxiety disorder. And you feel like she suffers from post-traumatic stress? I do. Now, at the time of this incident, this event, we're talking February 23rd of 2020, uh, you, would have, you were aware that she, she did not have much family support? Yes. Doctor, why do you administer psychological testing? Psychological testing allows an objective measurement of what the person's symptoms may be as compared to sort of an average. So if we can see what the average range on a standardized measure would be for any person, if there is an interpretable difference, that gives me clinical information. So it's not just relying on what the person has told me. I've got an objective measurement that I can compare to other people. And then I also administer psychological testing in a forensic evaluation to help assist me in making sure that the person is um, intending to put in good effort with me. In some forensic settings, a person may have a reason to present symptoms, like if they're in a custody evaluation, for instance, they might have a reason to um, minimize symptoms or they may exaggerate something else. And so assessments as to the person's response to you and if they're validly participating are important. So they're tests to see if you're faking or malingering or... 
that type thing. Right. And so you would call it feigning mental health symptoms when the person is either far exaggerating a symptom they do have, or if they're um, pretending to have a symptom that they do not actually have. Now, as it relates to Sarah Boone, what type of psychological testing did you administer? I administered the um, inventory of legal knowledge, and that is um, a test that has to do with whether or not she was validly participating regarding her understanding of the legal process. I also administered the Miller Forensic Assessment of Symptoms test. Now, what, explain to the jury what that Miller Forensic Assessment of Symptoms test is. So that is also a test of feigning to identify if she's validly participating in the evaluation. So if she had endorsed psychological symptoms or uh, psychiatric symptoms, that would be unusual or not typical of a valid psychiatric patient. What were the results of Ms. Boone's test on the Miller Forensic? Uh, she validly participated. There was no indication of any feigning or malingering. As far as the inventory of legal knowledge case, what were the results? Again, she was validly participating and she did not even come close to the cutoff. That would put her in the range of uh, feigning. Can you tell the jury what the purpose of the clinician administered post-traumatic stress disorder scale is? Yes. So that would be considered a very useful assessment of post-traumatic stress disorder. It allows me to interview a person about exposure to a traumatic incident and then identify if there's a change in behavior that has occurred as a result of that exposure to trauma. At the time that you administered that test, did Ms. Boone, in fact, have post-traumatic stress disorder? Well... What, or tell me the results. Just yes. Tell. So the results would be consistent with a person having post-traumatic stress disorder. I do not diagnose from one test. That wouldn't be appropriate. But it is consistent with the background and the symptoms that I had previously, um, you know, taken down during my evaluation of her. So the clinical portion, when we go through symptoms, that was consistent with the outcome of that test. And would this testing, <clears throat> all the testing, help you determine if Ms. Boone had a change in functioning from before the alleged trauma Bless you. To, to after the, the alleged trauma? And I'm referring to the trauma. We're going to talk about what, what the trauma was, but... Uh, the trauma was the inter intimate partner violence? That's correct. Okay. But would that testing help to determine if she had a change in functioning from that trauma of the inter in intimate partner violence? Absolutely. And did you determine that she did suffer from a trauma as a result of intimate partner violence? That was my conclusion. Yes, that's my opinion. Now, in considering all the available information, you don't just rely on what Ms. Bone tells you. To no. Your decisions. no, I don't. I do interview a person as part of the clinical forensic interview, of course, but I also consider things that are um, reported, like in their arrest narrative, witness statements, all of the medical records. So there are a variety of sources of information, collecting data points and reviewing those to arrive at a conclusion. So you did uh, review Ms. Boone's previous diagnoses in her history? Yes. Did you consider the previous diagnoses in arriving at your own? I did, yes. What did Ms. Boone, what had she been diagnosed with prior to you getting involved? Objection, seven, four, five, seven. Roach, the objection is sustained. But, but you would agree, and I think this is a fair question, you, you would consider prior <clears throat> other experts who, who may have diagnosed her with something. So I would definitely consider her mental health records, diagnoses previous clinicians may have arrived at at the time okay. when I diagnosed her myself. Okay, and given, given uh, the assessment that you did with uh, Sarah Boone and considering the totality and the time you spent with her and the other records, did, did you diagnose uh, Sarah Boone with anything? Yes, so post-traumatic stress disorder it's my opinion at the time of the offense, she had depression 
and she had an alcohol use disorder. I know we've talked about post-traumatic stress disorder. I don't know if I need to ask you anything further. I think the jury probably understands that. Is there anything else you wanted to add about that disorder? Um, I'm not sure what the jury has already been told about post-traumatic stress disorder, but in Sarah Boone's case specifically, because of enduring, um, she specifically noted the time that she was stabbed with the knife as being an extremely sustained. You, you have you have viewed have you viewed some exhibits involving her being stabbed? Um, I think that we have had exhibits in common. I'm not sure what was admitted. Have you seen the physical scar from Sarah Boone being stabbed in the back of the leg? Yes, I've seen her scar. Just, just generally, without getting specific, I, I think I've explained post-traumatic stress. But if there's if there's something else the jury th you believe the jury needs to know, but it's a it's a it's a sort of trauma that occurs as a result of one or more events. Post-traumatic stress disorder is the psychological after effect of being exposed to a very significant stressor or cumulative stressors that make the person's behavior, thinking, and mood uh, change. And so the, the change can include things like the person becomes hypervigilant, is easily startled, has trouble thinking, has trouble sleeping, so their body is in a state of agitation can also include, include changes in mood that um, would include irritability, um, difficulty relating to others, and that they might be resistant to trust easily. So those are all features. You have trouble sleeping sometimes. Yes. Sleep deprivation is a, is a real issue. Uh, it's associated with things like nightmares and having trouble settling. Now, you mentioned that you had diagnosed her with depression. Can you just give us a, a, a general understanding of the jury of depression? So the persistent sad mood, including feelings of hopelessness, helplessness, having difficulty concentrating, sleep problems, changes in appetite, those would be typical of depression. And Sarah Boone suffered from that? At near the time of the offense, yes. Can you explain to the jury alcohol use disorder? That's, that's a fairly new name. That's five or six years ago. We, the manual came up with a different name. It did, right? And so that would be, you know, in layman's terms, you might call that alcoholism. It's a tendency to uh, drink too much and then have some kind of consequence in your life as a result of your substance use. And alcoholism can be, um, d depending on how much you drink and then how often you drink. That's right. All that, all that is something that you would consider in diagnosing? Yes. The many people who suffer from alcohol use disorder, I don't know how to put this, are they in denial? I would say that that is one of the stages of alcohol use disorder and amenability to treatment. So in denial, um, it's because you do not want to acknowledge that there are consequences from your use because in doing that, you might have to reduce how much you're using. So to deny means that you feel that you can continue your use without having to change that. So you want to maintain the access to the substance. You don't have a problem. That's right. What is the difference between traits and a diagnosis? Well, we all have personalities. And so you're going to have coping mechanisms that include personality styles. So for instance, um, even though you might not be diagnosable as something, there are times when if you're upset, hurt, frustrated, you have a mood state that's unpleasant, you're going to deal with that by using some kind of coping mechanism. So traits of personality disorders might be present in the way that you deal with inner pain, things that you don't like, feeling. So some people, for instance, if they feel uncomfortable, they may cling too much or become excessively bonded um, to try to escape a feeling that they don't like, and that might be a dependent personality trait doesn't necessarily mean that they have a personality disorder because that would have to be pervasive across like all the environments. But when stressed or upset or not feeling good, you're going to use some kind of coping mechanism. And that might be one of the criterion, for instance, of the personality disorder. You would call that a trait. And 
Um, is it your understanding that this trauma that one suffers from repeat domestic violence uh, can cause one to be considered suffering from the syndrome, we call it battered spouse or bat battered woman syndrome? Yes. So the diagnosable condition would be PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder. That's how a clinician would um, label the response to trauma, the pattern between partners, the person's coping mechanism because of that trauma, that would be what's considered battered spouse or battered partner syndrome. And you're, you're aware that that concept uh, of being traumatized by the battered spouse syndrome or the post-traumatic stress is relevant to uh, a self-defense case? Yes. In criminal context. Yes, I understand that. Can you tell us. A little bit about that. Well, under the battered spouse syndrome, the person would experience a trauma or a situation in which they feared harm. And based on that fear of harm, they would react in a certain way that might not be understandable to other people. So their fear is based on the pattern of behavior between them and their partner that might not be the case for another set of people. Now, I know that uh, Dr. Lenore Walker is the one who first uncovered this syndrome back in the 70s. Her research study generated the term. Uh, she was interested in why battered women specifically at first, that was what was studied, didn't leave their partner because of course they're experiencing traumatic events, risks to their life, but then they didn't leave. So she undertook the original research study on that. Just briefly touch on, because I know Dr. Brandon has this, uh, there was a three stages um, that, that Dr. Walker developed for uh, that syndrome. I think you're referring to phases that a person may go through or the cycle of the relationship that includes the tension building phase in which there is the first instance that tension is building within the partner. There might be a change in tone, a signaling that there's a, a difference in agitation. The second is the true battering event. So something has happened between the partners um, that's violent in nature. And then third, there's the honeymoon phase, which is to keep the relationship intact um, the batter would engage in what's like called honeymoon behaviors, like trying to repair the relationship, apologize, essentially keep the victim from departing from the relationship. So those are three phases. And is it fair to say that psychologically the, the abuser, does alcohol often involved in the abuse? Yes. And as far as the one, the victim, that's getting abused, and you say it's a cycle, is uh, is the victim, you know, when they go through that last stage, the honeymoon stage, are they thinking, okay, it's, it's going to be better? Yes, the hopefulness in that, trying to believe that the behavior has changed, um, that they're not going to be abused again, the hopefulness to maintain the relationship, to forgive, um, that's part of that last stage, phase three, is maintaining the relationship. I don't think I've asked this. Why would someone who has been exposed to intimate partner violence perceive the likelihood of of a, a, a new violent event about to appear? Why would they perceive the likelihood of that violence differently than, say, a normal person? Well, it speaks to the pattern. So any relationship will have its own special pattern that you have things that only your partner knows about you or certain looks that you give that mean something. And you learn that over time. So over a period of uh, incidents, basically the victim begins to perceive cues that would signal impending danger. Those cues could be really subtle, just a change in tone or some small behavior that might not mean much to another person, but it has preceded other violent acts. So, for instance, if your husband decides that he is not going out that night, he might put on different clothes to stay home. And that could be a signal, like abuse and violence has occurred in his stay-at-home clothes, 
for instance. That might not mean much to another person because, again, it's specific to that dyad. Those two people know those patterns. So the victim may perceive a small or subtle change in their partner as a cue because they've become hypervigilant. The body knows when it's experienced a threat to itself and it will take note. We record memories differently when we're at risk. So these subtle cues become very well memorized by somebody who's being victimized. Battered spouse syndrome is a subset of post-traumatic stress disorder, which you've diagnosed Sarah Boone with. Um, when those personality changes occur and they persist after an individual has been exposed to this extreme stress, is that when the diagnosis occurs? Um, the changes would be as a result of the pattern, the person experiences a change like in their sleeping, in their hypervigilance, that's when you can diagnose it. So you can have a trauma or an experience of, you know, scary incident, but it doesn't mean that you will absolutely have post-traumatic stress disorder. You have to have those reactive symptoms that would suggest that it's present. In your opinion, and I know you've gone over this event with Sarah, Sarah Boone, this uh, February 23rd, 2020 event. It, it is your opinion that she was suffering from battered spouse syndrome at the time of that event? Yes, she had the patterns ingrained in her behavior that would be typical of a victim who's responding to traumatic events in a predictable way. So that would fit that. And it's fair to say that because of the intimate partner and the prior violence that you would have a heightened sense of when danger or was about to occur. Yes. When a threat was about to occur. Yes. Threat of danger. That's right. Now I want to talk about placating the abuser. Are there predictive cues which an abuser may exhibit to a victim that result in a high level of anxiety arousal in which the battered woman may attempt to reduce through several different means to delay the beating? Can you explain that? Yes. So the, the phase of the relationship that starts with that tension building, that is a jumping off point Potentially. So if you can stop the escalation, you might stay in phase one for a period of time. Phase one being that tension building phase and trying to reduce it and not allow it to escalate. So placating the abuser might include distraction. It could include um, substance use. It could include a change of scenery. There are a lot of things that a partner will learn to do so that they don't have the escalation into an abusive event, if possible doesn't always stop it. Now, in reviewing all of the data, all the reports, medical records, and whatever reports you considered, um, videotape that you may have watched, as it relates specifically to Sarah Boone, are her words her power? Uh, her words, I would say, are the weapon that she has. In reviewing the available like videos that I had to review, you would see that when Ms. Boone is very stressed, when she's experiencing a high level of anxiety, she becomes short in her tone. You can hear that in her voice. There's a strain, sharper words come out. I think that that is the way that she would try to respond to uh, Mr. Torres, you can hear that sharpness in her voice when she's very stressed out. Now, would you agree that uh, victims may exhibit a range of behaviors when they're suffering from intimate popular violence? Yes. Self-isolation? Yes. Suicidal thoughts? Yes. Substance abuse? Yes. And there are often physical signs of injury, such as bruising? That's correct. Chronic fatigue? Yes. Learned helplessness? Yes. Can you tell the, I know Dr. Brandon spoke on it, but could you tell us a little bit about that? So learned helplessness is when you start to form the opinion that nothing's going to make any difference. It comes originally from an animal study um, in which dogs were shocked and 
the research study indicated that even when dogs were given an opportunity to escape the environment in which they were being shocked, if they were shocked enough, they just stopped trying to escape. So even though they had an opportunity to do so, they did not do that. That's called learned helplessness. It's the idea or belief that what your actions are going to do are not going to make a difference. So don't try. What are, what are intrusive memories? Intrusive memories are an element of post-traumatic stress disorder in which you don't want to be thinking of a traumatic event, but it intrudes on something else you're trying to do. Like maybe you're folding socks or something like that, just doing something mindless. And that's what takes over your thought process. It's not something that you're trying to think about. We could plan what we're thinking about. Or sometimes if you're just having this intrusive experience, that's not what you were intending to think about at all. Is that one of the conditions that someone may suffer uh, when they have this syndrome of battered spouse? Yes. I know there can be triggers um, that that bring on these memories. Am, that, am I correct? That's correct. Are there also symptoms of this syndrome where, um, like, like in the alcoholism where you denial, that you have denial that you're in the middle of this cycle? Well, as part of the relationship, there's an element of pleasure. Like you, you have early on in the relationship, something that binds you together. So you're remembering that you're hoping for that. Um, even though the repeated cycle is going through the phases one, two, and three, you keep hoping for elements of that honeymoon phase wishing that it was better. So it is like denial. You're um, imagining the way it used to be. You have a recollection of that person showing you positive behaviors and you're, you know, hoping for that. I also think it is typical for victims to not reveal to other people that the abuse is going on. And it seems like denial. In other words, your coworkers ask you like, are you okay? Did something happen to you? You're not likely to disclose that. That looks a lot like denial. It is a denial in public of some of the private issues that you're having in your relationship. And that's because it's embarrassing. It's revealing a loss of control to other people. It's revealing that things aren't perfect. You might even get feedback that you should leave your partner and that's unwanted because you're already having that, you know, concern in your own mind about it. And so, you know, it seems like denial on the outside to hide it. Would you agree many people who suffer from this, uh, they're minimizing what is happening to them? Yes. And they're numbing their emotions to it. Well, to stay present and keep that relationship, it's very difficult for a lot of people because they're experiencing physical and emotional harm. So they want to numb it because numbing it means that you can keep that relatedness no matter how bad it's getting. Do some people with this syndrome disassociate? Objection relevance. Approach. Objection relevance is overruled. Do you agree that battered women often develop the defense mechanism of being able to psychologically detach from their body during a traumatic experience? Some people do experience. I'm just going to list some of the symptoms that you find in, in battered spouse women and just to see if you agree with these. We talked about intrusive memories and flashbacks of the past traumatic events. Do you agree with that? Yes. The severe anxiety and hypervigilance. Yes. The panic attacks. That is sometimes present. It depends on how the person experiences anxiety, but some do have panic attacks. Very low self-esteem. Yes. Poor body image. Sometimes. Feeling that they have no control. Yes. Sexual dysfunction. It can be, particularly if the trauma includes sexualized attacks. Short-term memory problems and confusion. Yes, that's part of PTSD sometimes. And they can act, the actual they can actually have physical health problems, chronic from the chronic stress and physical violence. That's correct. Fear. Yes. Constant fear. That is correct. Now, the abusive partner, the abu the abuser, part of the abuse would be hitting, kicking, punching, choking, burning, and biting. Approach. You may proceed, sir. All right, I'm asking about common 
things that occur by the abusive partner towards the victim that create this intimate partner violence or create this syndrome in the woman hitting. Yes, that could be an overt act. Kicking. Yes. Punching. Yes. Choking. Yes. Burning. Yes. You be using weapons to hurt you. Yes. A knife. Correct. Curtain rod. Yes. Threatening to hurt you, your children, or your pets. Yes. Belittling and humiliating you. That's correct. Taking your car keys. That would be considered a form of control, so yes. Controlling your money. Yes. Control where you go and who you see. Correct. And who you can talk to. That's right. Force you to have sex when you don't want to. Yes. Stalking you. Yes. Slapping you. Correct. You agree victims that suffer from this abuse experience feelings of anger? Yes, that can be in some of the phases. So, Madness. Yes. Hopelessness. Yes. Worthlessness. Correct. Intense feelings of fear. Yes. Abusers have a tendency to have low self-esteem themselves. Overruled. Abu abusers. Overruled. The abuser can have low self-esteem himself. Yes. Have a desire for power and control. Correct. Have a tendency to use alcohol or drugs. Yes. Abusers oftentimes have temper. That's correct. Become jealous easily. Yes. Very possessive. Can be. The victims can suffer from se severe psychological distress. That's correct. Is that what Sarah Boone suffered from? Yes. Is it fair to say that it takes time, a number of times, to visit with someone like this to build trust? Yes. Traumatized people are slow to disclose information. You have to build rapport. You have to make sure that they experience you uh, discussing other things without an emotional reaction. They feel easily judged, as we mentioned, have defensive denial, things like that. So you need to build good rapport in doing an assessment with somebody that's experienced trauma. So a lot of times they're very slow to open up and tell you about the abuse. That is correct. And they'll actually often lie about it. Deny it, yes. And just say that that's not the issue or they're fine. So oftentimes I'll have an evaluation request come from an attorney who's having difficulty interacting with their client and then it, ultimately it's a result of trauma. Now I know that you viewed everything and I know you've seen her nine times. Is there any, did, did you feel like you had enough time? Was nine visits enough time for you to feel like you had enough time and information to form the opinions that you've expressed here today and given to this group? Yes. That's all the questions I have. Okay. Any cross-examination? Yes, sir. Good afternoon, Dr. Harper. Good afternoon. So you have done some evaluation work on battered spouse syndrome for a prosecution in the past? No. All right. Have you done insanity evaluations for the prosecution in the past? I have been called uh, to testify about that. So you understand when the government obtains a court order for their expert to come in and do evalu an evaluation, it's for one evaluation, correct? Uh, I believe that you're saying that the government can retain their own expert, yes. No, I mean, what I'm talking about is you just uh, went through that you had nine visits with Ms. Boone? Correct? I did, yes. And is, that was over the course of eight different days because two of those visits were morning and afternoon sessions, correct? That's right. And what we are trying to help you uh, have the jury understand is that when you get hired by the government and the court gives you an order to go evaluate somebody, you get one crack at the apple. Is that your understanding from your past work working for the government? No, that's not always correct. There are many instances in competency evaluations where evaluators will request additional visits if they cannot determine their opinion on the first visit. All right. Specifically when it comes to an affirmative defense such as battered spouse evidence and insanity, what is your understanding and your expertise? Um, what is my understanding of the what? issue? What? Oh. Judge, the question... Legal objection. Uh, objection. Legal grounds. He asked a question about battered spouse and approach as battered spouse syndrome being used for self-defense or not and insanity. Um, 
it requires a court order for the state to go have an evaluator go, right? Yes. All right. Now, what are the agreed upon criteria uh, for battered spouse syndrome? Well, you would evaluate if the person is indeed suffering from a uh, behavioral response, like a mental disorder. So first of all, has the person demonstrated that they've got a behavioral change? And is it in response to a violent act? Do they perceive threat where they've been exposed in the past? So pattern of violence that has repeated. Does control over uh, another person in an intimate relationship have anything to do with it? Yes, it can. Does isolation have anything to do with it? Yes. And by control, I mean controlling who you go see, who you hang out with, so on and so forth? Yes. And could it involve controlling personal items of the other person as well? Yes, it can. So that's what I'm asking. Like in the DSM-5-TR, I believe you pulled up narcissistic personality disorder. Yes. And so when you do that, it pulls up and it says there's nine criteria and five of those criteria must be met um, to make a diagnosis for narcissistic personality disorder, correct? That's right. Now, battered spouse syndrome is not recognized by the DSM-5-TR, correct? No, it's not a diagnosis. You wouldn't use it as a diagnosis. And what I'm asking is, even though we haven't written it down in V, Diagnostic Statistical Manual, and I mean the, like, the Ohio State University or something. Is it written down anywhere? Can, can one psychologist or psychiatrist rely upon um, a recipe or a list of criteria um, that everyone else would be using in your field as well? There is no standardized approach you must follow. In other words, sometimes if we have a statute, for instance, it would identify what we must investigate. It, it doesn't exist like that. There's no uh, statute directing it. And there's nothing written down anywhere that says, of these nine criteria, these things must exist. Controlling your partner, isolating your partner, beating your partner, so on and so forth, correct? That's right. Now, this kind of abuse can come in the form of emotional or mental abuse uh, outside completely of physical or sexual abuse, correct? Um, so that is a component. You can have extreme mental abuse occur of a person, yes. And if that person responds to that environmental stimuli of whatever it is the partner is saying or doing to them, they may internally view that as traumatic. They could. Or they may not. That's right. It's entirely possible for two people to be in a three-and-a-half-year relationship that has physical violence and neither one of them feel traumatized by that. Is that correct? That's right. If they have enough supportive or positive experiences that would negate that ratio. So of positive to negative, they may, they may feel okay. And a man can be subjected to this sort of trauma, whether it be physical, emotional, or sexual by an intimate partner as well, correct? That's right. And it's basically kind of, it's unique to each relationship, right? That is right. But trauma is in the eye of the beholder. Is that fair? Um, Whether a negative experience traumatizes somebody is going to be in the eye of the person who experienced that stimuli, correct? I, I only partially agree with you. It's a complicated answer because some of the manifestations of trauma are behavioral. So, for instance, when I evaluate veterans who have returned and they may not know that they've been traumatized their body their bodily responses that include like difficulty concentrating they can't sleep they're hyper vigilant their the PTSD diagnosis encompasses outward manifestations so even though they don't acknowledge trauma you can still identify it as a clinician but still Somebody like a homicide detective or a homicide prosecutor can go to scenes where there are dead bodies, go to autopsies where there are dead bodies, and not walk away with any trauma, correct? Whereas somebody else might. Right. The environmental, I guess, cues for that person and also working with law enforcement, they become seasoned to micro traumas. So the first, almost every police officer can remember the first dead body they've seen. So it's in their memory. And then they become accustomed 
to seeing gruesome scenes, they have increased tolerance over time because it's part of their job. It may not be part of their intimate relationship that they have with someone else. Now, you brought up veterans. Is something common with PTSD with veterans? Something like firecrackers may set them off because it re reminds them of acts of war. That's right. You're not suggesting to the jury today that if somebody who returns with PTSD from service and hears firecrackers is justified in going outside and just shooting bullets everywhere, correct? No, it's not what I said. I'm, I'm not saying you did. <laughs> okay. Um, what, what this battered spouse syndrome evidence is helpful for is not that subjective uh, mindset, but rather helping to explain the objective circumstances that are presented to somebody and how it might be different from somebody with those experiences. They may view something objectively different. I, I partially disagree with your question because I, I would say that there are incidents or actual events between partners that would be a, a factual thing. Something has happened. And then the person subjectively experiences that as, um, you know, intrusive or controlling or traumatic. So that is the person's felt or subjective experience. The objective part is what happened. But again, as a forensic psychologist, you're familiar with the justified use of force instruction, correct? I'm not a lawyer, though, so I am aware of it, but I cannot debate fine points of that with you. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, I'm just help, helping. I'm trying to understand what you said before, because there is a subjective component, whether or not a person believes subjectively that they need to use some sort of force, deadly or non-deadly. You agree with that, correct? I do. And then there's also a second component that it's objectively reasonable to the ordinary person to use force, correct? I understand what you're saying, yes. And what I believe I heard you mention earlier about battered spouse syndrome was originally it was meant to help understand why people stay in these relationships. Originally, yes. Because it may not just be intuitive to somebody who doesn't understand these things, why somebody who is abused time and time and time again would remain in that relationship, correct? That's right. And again, and I know you're not a lawyer, um, but if the law has evolved about retreat and not having to retreat and so on and so forth, that kind of changes some of the lens of this, correct? Judge, I'm going to object. Approach. Okay. Um, question withdrawn. You may proceed. So you would agree that... Uh, Hypothetically, if somebody is running down their partner, saying negative things about them, telling them they're unattractive, telling them things that would potentially hurt their feelings, that could be an element of control of a of, of verbally abusive relationship. It could. Propping one up, hypothetically saying, I'm the best thing that has ever happened to you. You'll never do better than me. Is that a, a potential component of the control that one in an abusive relationship might exert over an intimate partner? Uh, yes, to try to not uh, encourage their partner to leave them. Yeah. Considering gifts, hypothetically, that one partner has given to another partner, um, but considering it still to be your property because you gave it to them, is that a form of a potential exertion of control over an intimate partner when you give somebody hypothetically a bike, but still consider it your own bike? I mean, I would not, I don't think that's strong evidence of that. I think that it, it does happen in relationships and people do that in general, but I wouldn't say that's like really specific to this. How about hypothetically exerting control over your intimate partner's identification papers, such as a birth certificate? So that can happen. People will hide things that are required for work, for instance, like your driver's license or things like that. Now, I'm going to kind of, I'm asking yes or no questions. If Mr. Owens would like you to elaborate further, he's going to have that opportunity in a little bit. Mm -hmm. Hypothetically, if one partner destroys another partner's belongings, is that a potential uh, example of exerting control in a relationship? Yes. Thank you. Hypothetically, is threatening to or actually using legal process uh, as a threat against your in intimate partner in a potential indicia of controlling your partner? For instance, X, Y, or Z, or I'm going to get you arrested. Yes, I, I would agree that happens. 
I assume you would agree that the cycle of violence that we've described, the tension building, the blow up, and then the honeymoon phase, um, you would agree that just one of those cycles could be enough to give somebody a traumatic experience if they, pers if they took it as a traumatic experience. Yes. The defendant described her first date with Mr. Torres to you, did she not? She did. And at the time of, of this first date, they had obviously just met that night at a bar, correct? Right. They were not financially intertwined, correct? That's right. They shared no children in common? That's right. They did not live together? Correct. After this description that she provided you, which included him smashing her phone, correct? Yes. Hitting her, first time she'd ever been hit in her life, correct? Yes. Making her crouch in like a fetal position on the porch for several hours to the point where it hurt her back, correct? Yes. Threatened to so sodomize her. Correct. And she described that she was all bruised up, correct? Yes. After that, this is the first time she had ever met him, correct? I believe so. Yes. There was a second date, correct? Yes. Despite not having any of that intertwinement that we went through prior to this description, correct? That's right. Now, it is possible under what we've discussed, right? Just that quick one date can be that buildup of tension and blow up, correct? Yes. But it's different, hypothetically, than saying a spouse who is financially dependent on his or her other spouse in a 20-year marriage with a house full of kids um, than a first date, correct? You would agree in severity, in the intertwinement, there's a difference. There's a difference in intertwinement. The pattern can be exactly the same. Of course, there are many different reasons why somebody will stay in a relationship that, when perceived from the outside, others would say is abusive, correct? That's right. The defendant described that she felt like she was making Mr. Torres a better person, correct? That's right. A better father, yes. correct? Right. A better ex-husband? With phone calls, yes. And she would tell him to, to call his children. That's right. Make sure that he sent them Christmas gifts. Yes. And make sure she, he sent his ex-wife money when she asked, correct? Yes. So you would agree those are indicia or indicators, sorry. I understand. I know you need them. <laughs> um, that perhaps she wasn't necessarily financially dependent on Mr. Torres, correct? I'm not saying conclusion, but those are indicators. If you're saying, please spend your money elsewhere, that I don't need your money, correct? No, because even if there was money that was needed by Ms. Boone, her tendency to put the needs of her partner before her would direct her to do exactly that. Like, make him better. Make him have the availability to visit his children, send them presents, even if she's the one that needed the money. And in her perspective, Mr. Torres needed her to do this to make him a better person, correct? I believe that, yes. How many years of her adult life did she describe working? Um, I don't think she gave it a specific quantity. We just went through a variety of her jobs that she had in the past. And... You know, she was low 40s when she met you four yes. years ago? that's right. So she had been 18 for probably about 24 years. Did she give you a 24, right? 24 plus 18, 42? Well, you said four 24 years, and that's why I was confused. You can't be 18 for 24 years, but did, did, 24 years ago, I would agree. Did her work history kind of flesh out to be 24 years is what I'm asking? Um, I'm not certain. And at the time, um, in the apartment in 2020, she had not been working, correct? That's right. And not, had not been working for some time. That's right. And what she was doing was living off of the settlement that she had been bought out of with her husband was lump sum, plus 1000 a month in alimony and $100 a month in child support, correct? Yes. And it was Mr. Torres who would work, correct? He worked at Ace Hardware. When he would show up. Right. Sometimes he didn't show up is what she indicated, correct? Yes. Because of his drinking problems. Yes. Did she describe to you, well, let me strike that. She did describe to you one instance, at least, where violence occurred in front of her child, correct? Yes. And that her child had gone to school and reported it, correct? Yes. And you understand as a forensic psychologist that teachers are mandatory reporters, correct? That's right. 
Did you review any DCF records in this case? No, I didn't receive any DCF records. Did Ms. Boone ever indicate to you at any point in time she became too afraid to let Lucas come over to the house? Yes, there were times where she would um, ask Mr. Boone, so Brian Boone, to not bring him there. And Mr. Boone was aware of this because she would say things like that, correct? Yes. And at different times, she told you that she would go over to Mr. Boone's house to escape the violence of Mr. Torres. That's right. February 24th of 2020, the child was scheduled to be picked up by Ms. Boone, correct? That's right. Despite everything that she was aware of and what Mr. Brian Boone was aware of, correct? Right. And you saw in her police interview that she swore on the life of her son that she was telling them the truth, correct? Sure. Yes. Yes. Object. Approach. Objection sustained. I would phrase it. She swore on her son's life that it was not intentional that uh, she ended up killing Mr. Torres, correct? Yep. That. I object. Approach. Objection sustained. Question is stricken. She, quote unquote, swore on her ch child's life that it was not intentional. That. That. Correct? Before I answer it, like you to direct me to that part of her interview. So I'll, I'll strike it with you. It's on video. Some of Miss Boone's mm. um, diagnoses predated her relationship with Mr. Torres, correct? Yes. And so when diagnoses predate a intimate, a violent intimate partner relationship, um, there is an independent cause, even though they may then later contribute to the phenomenon we see, correct? Well, I wouldn't say that all mental disorders have an independent cause. Sometimes they're spontaneous or biological in nature. Well, let's talk about hers. I mean, you, you're familiar with her prior diagnoses and you went through her childhood, so on and so forth, correct? I did. So she was bringing some things with her prior to Mr. Torres relationship, correct? She had, uh, these... I'll say yes or no, ma'am. Yes, she did. You reviewed, uh, some Advent health records, correct? Of hers? Yes. And some Aspire records of hers, correct? Yes. And you would agree that there are time in the Advent health records where she goes to the hospital and then leaves before getting treated, correct? Yes. And there are there is a time when she goes to the hospital where she is described, their words, not mine, as having ETOH on board. Yes. Do you understand what ETOH means? In a medical record, you would use that shorthand for alcohol. Right? Yes. Drinking alcohol, not the other stuff. Correct. And in the records that you uh, reviewed from Aspire, um, she came with complaints of depression in January of 2018, correct? That's right. And ethanol or alcohol is a central nervous system depressant, correct? Yes. And you're, I know you're a psychologist, not a psychiatrist. So let me know if I'm, I'm pushing you too far and you're not going to answer. Um, but you are familiar generally with the effects ethanol has on the body. Generally, yes. And you can and do make diagnoses of alcohol abuse disorder. I do. And in your professional life or personal life, are you familiar with the standard serving size of, of drinks when you're evaluating somebody's drinking? For instance, hey, I only drink two drinks a day. All right, well, are they 64 ounce mugs of beer or are they 12 ounce? So are you familiar in that context? It might be a question I would ask during evaluation. What are you referring to? Is it a mixed drink? Is it a shot? Like I try to identify that. Have you ever ask if somebody says they drink two glasses of wine, well, how big are the glasses of wine? Sometimes. And is your understanding that five ounces is the standard serving of wine since it's about 12% alcohol? I'm not sure what the standard size is, but I would ask regarding like a wine glass. And in January of 2018, when she came in, Crying and complaining of symptoms consistent with depression, she had a blood alcohol level of 0.165, correct? I believe so. And in October of 2018, um, when she ended up going to Aspire, when she was found stumbling by police, she had a blood alcohol or breath alcohol of 0.185. I'm reacting to your description of her stumbling by police. I know she approached police for help, so... So there have been two sets of records, but I believe you may have the same set that I received on September 27th, 24. Can you turn to page 21 of 57 of the Aspire records? Mine aren't numbered, but... All right. October of 2018, or of 2018 there was a second um, visit to Aspire, 
and that was based upon her being found stumbling by law enforcement with a point one eight five, correct? Uh, she walked right up. That. Okay, um, so I'd have to say no. The way you phrased the question, ma'am, Boone was stumbling due to her level of impairment, paren point one eight five. Yes, I would agree. Is that part of the records you relied upon? Yes. Thank you. When you talked to Ms. Boone about that, um, she kind of just described an event of June of 2018 and blurring those two events, did she not? No, she she told me she had two different Baker acts. Did she describe it as being June of 2018? Um, I'll have to reference my interview note to find that if you would like me to. No. You remember giving a deposition on October 1st at the state attorney's office downstairs? I do. And um, at that point in time, and I'll ask opposing party, you want me to uh, show her prior statement before I ask her about it? I think she's got a deposition. Do you have your transcript? I do. Okay. <coughs> Just so for the record, it's page 34 that I'm referring to, line 16 and 17. Yes, I'm with you. That is June of 2018. That's when I said in my deposition that she was ex uh, describing her experience in June of 18. And she described this experience as uh, going to the hospital to find a pastor, correct? Yes. And ends up going to what we call Lakeside then and Aspire now, right? Yes. And then what you described was she was talking about more of the violence that occurred specifically. Um, regarding a significant episode of Jorge driving her roughly in the car, so on and so forth, correct? Yes. All right. Those were two separate incidences. January, when she came looking for the pastor, correct? Um, so I'm just clarifying. There's a record that we started with this conversation from October of 2018, and there is a description of her trying to go to the hospital to seek a counselor. So those are two different instances. In, in January of 2018, when she went to the hospital crying and, and signs of depression, Bless you. she indicated that was because her husband and son had uh, gone out of town and she was feeling lonely and sad about had, having lost her job a few weeks earlier, right? There were numerous stressors there, yes. Nothing mentioned about any problems with somebody named Mr. Jorge or George Torres, correct? You're talking about January? Yes, ma'am. So the hospital records are not referencing her relationship with George on the January date. Now, in talking about February 23rd, 2020 with Ms. Boone, you, you talked to her about that on several occasions, correct? I did. And part of one of those conversations, at least, was about an incident that she indicated had happened the night before February 23rd, 2020, correct? Yes. She indicated and told you that she had been dragged down the stairs the night before um, the suitcase incident, correct? That's right. And in part of your review of this case, you reviewed all the crime scene photos, correct? Yes. Those include photographs of Miss Boone, correct? Yes. Were there any indications in the photographs of injuries on her consistent with being dragged down the stairs of, of carpet? Uh, not, I didn't see inside her scalp, so I didn't see photos of inside, you know, her hair follicles and this area of her head. On her outward body, there were no indications of that. Did you ask her uh, how it was that she was injured during this dragging down the stairs? Um, I don't think I went through specific injuries to her, no. Do you agree that alcohol intoxication affects the credibility of a historian that's providing history to you, patient or a client? If they're actively intoxicated, yes. We had talked, well, we, you and Mr. Owens, um, had talked about narcissistic personality disorder earlier. Yes. And that is a recognized diagnosis in the DSM-5TR. That's right. There's nine of those, correct? Nine traits? Are you talking about, you're talking about the criterion of narcissistic personality disorder. Yes. yes. Like page 761 on your hard copy. Thank you. All right. With my clothes? I have a digital copy. 760, but it's, it's fine. <laughs> One of the criteria is has a grandiose, grandiose sense of self-importance, 
Paren, for example, exaggerates achievements and talents, expects to be recognized as superior without commensurate achievements, correct? Yes. <laughs> Two is preoccupied with fantasies of unlimited success, power, brilliance, beauty, or ideal love, correct? Yes. Three, belief that he or she is special and unique and can only be understood by or should associate with other special or high status people, paren, or institutions, correct? Uh, so three, just... Caveat, it says believes, not belief. But the rest of what you said I agree with is the criteria. Four, requires excessive admiration. Yes. Five, has a sense of entitlement, paren, unreasonable expectations of especially favorable treatment or automatic compliance with his or her expectations. Correct? Yes. Six, is interpersonally exploitive, paren, takes advantage of others to achieve his or her own ends. Correct? Is interpersonally exploitative. Seven, lacks empathy, is unwilling to recognize or identify with the feelings and needs of others, right? Yes. Eight, is often envious of others or believes that others are envious of him or her, right? Yes. Nine, shows arrogant or haughty behaviors or attitudes. Yes. You believe that she has traits of that disorder, correct? Yes. Grandiose self, sense of self-importance? There are indications that she feels like that or has expressed that before. So that's a yes. Yes. Preoccupied with fantasies of unlimited success, power, brilliance, beauty, or ideal love? No. You remember going to the state attorney's office on October 1st, of 2024, and giving a deposition? I do. And it was in front of a court reporter, like Madam Court Reporter here? Yes. And you swore to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, correct? Yes. <laughs> And referring to page 89, lines 18 through 20, let me know when you're ready. Are you ready? Yes. Did you give the following answer to the following question? Preoccupied with fantasies of unlimited success, power, brilliance, beauty, or ideal love? And your answer was yes? I did answer yes there. She does not, according, uh, in your estimation, does not believe that she is special and unique and can only associate with high-status people, correct? No does not require ad, uh, excessive admiration, correct? Correct. Does have a sense of entitlement? Yes. Is not interpersonally exploitive? Correct, is not. And when discussing whether or not she lacked empathy or was unwilling to recognize or identify with the feelings or needs of others, you indicated that that might be the case, but it's not intentional. In other words, she's not aware if she's inconveniencing others. So there was three of those traits, correct? Yes. Not five, which would be required, correct? For a diagnosis of the personality disorder. If that were the correct diagnosis, you would need five. During your conversations with Ms. Boone, the defendant in this case, uh, she explained to you that cheating to her means when Mr. Torres would look at pornography, correct? Correct. Not a real life woman, correct? No, not that he was engaging in sexual intercourse with actual women. Part of the records that you did not uh, review were the text messages that were part of the phone extraction of her phone device, correct? That's right. You indicated in your conversation with uh, Mr. Owens that some of the traits that are common, commonly seen in abusers would be control, jealousy, easily angered. This could be, yes. What other traits for... Just common for abusers. Um, being a person who segregates their victim away from other sources of support, somebody that exhibits coercive control, meaning that um, they would prevent the person from engaging in activities that would be independent, so restricting their ability to have independent like life, job, money, things like that, that would be um, supportive of them being left, for instance. Uh, other things would be using emotional expressions like rage to cause a physiological reaction in another person. So those could be additional descriptions. Specifically, the materials you reviewed. I just want to make sure we're on the same page. Paperwork from prior cases uh, involving Mr. Torres and Ms. Boone? Yes. Medical records for Mr. Torres? That's right. The medical and Aspire records for Ms. Boone that we've discussed? 
Yes. The crime scene photos from the incident in February. That's right. Pages one through 413 in discovery in this case. Right. Um, a photograph of a suitcase and two videos involving a suitcase. That's right. And additional videos uh, on that phone, correct? Yes. Uh, such as uh, baseball bat smash on the TV? That's part of it, yes. And then did you review any um, other videos where there's conversations between Ms. Ms. Boone and Mr. Torres? Yes. One prior 911 call? Yes. Now, today you had indicated um, that you had reviewed the photographs from some prior incidents of violence, um, correct? Yes. When is it that you did that? Is that recently? Um, no, there are there are um, photos included uh, with the um, the prior case packages. Case packages. Thank you. I'm not sure what to call it. So that's fine. All right. All right. And did you review any body worn camera from those prior case packages? No, I did not. I didn't have that. Anything else that you reviewed that I've not covered? Are you speaking of documents only? Yes, yes, materials other than uh, your nine visits with Ms. Boone. All right, just checking with the funders I prepared for today. Um, I don't know if, I guess that would be part of the discovery, the investigative report is within those 413 pages. Did you interview anybody else personally besides Ms. Boone? Yes. Who else did you personally interview? Melissa Sexton. Anybody else? No. You didn't interview Brian Boone, correct? I did not. You did not interview their child in common, correct? No. And you didn't review the phone text messages extracted from her device, correct? No, I didn't. Did you review any uh, records from the jail? No. And, um, Judge? Yes. The objection is sustained in part and overruled in part. You testified earlier. Um, in the normal course of practice of forensic psychology and psychiatry, you all do rely upon the diagnoses of other experts, correct? You can inform my opinion, yes. And you have not re reviewed any electronic communications um, in the form of text um, regarding Ms. Boone's case, correct? No, I did not. Or re recorded phone calls of any type, correct? Uh, well, not one one. Okay. Other than that. <laughs> no, other than that. <laughs> now, let's talk about the February 23rd, 2020. Um, she told you that they didn't really have anything going on to do that particular day, correct? Yes. It was a Sunday, correct? Yes. <laughs> um, did some chores, and then as a reward, uh, they could rest after doing those chores, correct? Right. She indicated to you that she and Mr. Torres did not begin drinking till about 4 p.m., correct? I'll have to reference. Page 36 of your deposition, if you can okay. use that. Great. 36? Yes, ma'am. All right, I'm with you. Around 4 p.m. Um, and you reviewed the crime scene photos of this case, correct? I did. That included receipts uh, for some purchases that were made at the Publix on February 22nd and 23rd, correct? That's right. And one of those receipts was a purchase for a a 1.5 liter bottle of Woodbridge Chardonnay at 12.17 p.m. on February 23rd, correct? Yes. Did you question her about the inconsistency of them having purchased uh, a bottle of wine at 12.17 that afternoon and not start drinking until 4 p.m.? No. And did she tell you that they had any wine left over from the day before that they consumed that day? At some point, I'm not sure if it was the day that I was going through this line by line with you in my deposition, but I am aware, yes, that there was an uh, unfinished bottle of wine from some other date. And then, as the receipt showed, there was two additional bottles of 1.5 liters of wine purchased at 12.17 p.m. and about 5.30 p.m. on the 23rd, correct? Right. Were you aware of approximately how much Ms. Boone, the defendant, weighed at the time of this offense, February 23rd, 2020? Uh, around 100 pounds. And in the first 413 pages of discovery, I believe, was the autopsy report, correct? Right. So you're aware that Mr. Toros was 103 pounds at his death? Yes. Do you take into account uh, this alcohol consumption when evaluating what Ms. Boone is telling you about the events of the day? Yes. Did she tell you whether or not she was intoxicated by the amount of alcohol she consumed that day? 
Please uh, silence your cell phone. So she did not describe herself as intoxicated originally when we discussed this. So, um, so the answer is no. She did not describe herself as intoxicated. intoxicated right. Hypothetically, if she had told the jury that she was intoxicated at the time of the offense, would that affect um, your evaluation of her credibility of the history she provided you? No, because that was also my opinion. Did she indicate to you um, in describing the events of February 23rd, 2020, that there was any point in time she just simply did not remember? Yes. What points in time were those? Um, so she did not remember taking the videos, the suitcase, or you know, the incident in the suitcase until she was at the interrogation room, I guess, and then they were going through them with her. Then she recalled that. I'm talking about specifically with you. Did she indicate that there were any portions of the night that, or day or night that she did not remember? Uh, I can't recall anything specifically right now. Hypothetically, if she had indicated to the jury mm -hmm. that she did not remember the nine or 10 minutes immediately preceding the first video being taken, would that be inconsistent with what she told you then? No. Well, she didn't indicate to you that she forgot any part of the night, right? Right. She just didn't say that. So. Would it affect your evaluation of what she told you about the events of February 23rd, 2020, if she hypothetically has testified that she did not remember 10 minutes um, before the videos? Not really, no, because it, the event and the, uh, like the course of events that she narrated to me occurred over several hours. So when you interview somebody about circumstances of an offense, it's the usual for someone to not remember every single minute for hours at a time. I can't imagine that anybody's memory could hold that much unless they have like photographic well, memory or something. I'm not asking about hours and hours, of, you know, itemization of her day's events. We're talking about the 20 minutes of the offense. Um, does that affect your the weight that you give her history she provided you? It's just yes or no. No. Now, what she indicated to you was the day had been going well. It was fun and games, correct? Yes. Conflict-free? Um, to her, she said it was a good day. So okay. that's what she told me. She said it was a good day. Yes. And there comes a point in time where the activities turn towards hide and seek, correct? Yes. She goes up to the shower? Right. And when she comes down from the shower... That's when Mr. Torres is in this suitcase, correct? Getting into it. And she goes over to the suitcase and zips it, correct? Yes. And did she describe whether it was 100% zipped to you or just a certain percentage? Uh, she said that it wasn't zipped all the way. And still then, that was funny to the two of them at first, correct? That's right. And then there came a point in time where Mr. Torres was getting mad about being zipped in the suitcase. He told me that he was getting mad. Yes. And that, in turn, made her mad. That's right. What the, Mr. Torres was saying was, I can't breathe, correct? That is what's recorded on the video. Well, I'm asking you about what you recorded her saying. Well, what made her mad was not that he was saying he couldn't breathe. It's what he was saying that was making her mad. Well, what else was he saying? Um, she... At the time, she said that he said something that was making her mad. And so that's the extent of what we talked about at that moment. So you didn't elaborate what something was that made her mad, correct? Right. She said he said something that made her mad, and that started making her mad. You didn't uh, find it important to learn what specifically he said that made her mad, correct? I don't agree that I didn't find it important. Okay. Then explain, why wouldn't you ask that question? Because as a person who is traumatized is describing their experience as a trained clinician, you will allow open-ended discussion of that experience. And so it's not an interrogation. You don't go asking confrontational questions at the time of their first narration. Well, you had nine visits with her. Did you follow up on your ninth visit? I asked her different questions about 
Did you ever ask be her confrontational? Did you ever ask her specifically in any of your nine visits with her what it was that he said that made her mad? No. She never described him doing anything to make her mad, but it was words, correct? Right. And once she got mad, she decided that she was going to leave him in there for two minutes. That's right. Not three, not one, but two, correct? That's what she said. And the reason she was doing that was because she wanted him to understand how it feels to be choked and what she had experienced. That's right. Did you ask her why she didn't let him out of the suitcase after two minutes? Um, yes, I did actually ask her that. Well, she thought that he could get out himself. That's one thing. She said that when she was able to unzip it, it was not um, some significant thing. She was able to unzip it easily. So she said it never occurred to her that he couldn't get out. And you reviewed the still photograph um, of the suitcase as well as the two videos. Right. And did you understand what the metadata or what the timestamps were for each of those items? Um, I'm sure when I reviewed it, I saw the timestamp. Yeah. Would you agree that 20 minutes is 10 times as long as two minutes? I would. And if Mr. Torres had not been able to get himself out of the suitcase within 20 minutes, um, she, didn't in, she didn't indicate that she let him out, correct? She did not. She described to you, Miss Boone being the she, that she was helpful to the police? Yes. Do you consider, do you agree with that assessment that she was helpful to the police? Um, in the sense that uh, she was having conversations with them without counsel, I would consider that helpful to the police. Do you think lying to the police is helpful to the police's investigation? No. Do you agree that she was not truthful with them? Uh, Yes, I think that I would agree with that. And when she described getting Mr. Torres out of the suitcase, she described stretching his little legs? Yes. And she stated to you there was no fight that day, correct? That's right. Physi she wanted him to be uncomfortable. I need to clarify. Physical fight. Right. Yes. Um, just wanted him to be uncomfortable. Yes. Correct. There was a description of a bat and her using it to nudge, right? Hoke. Oak. And so do we agree that that means like poking out like this as opposed to swinging it like you're a baseball hitter? I would agree with you. And you reviewed the autopsy of the fort, correct? I believe so. Did you get an opportunity to review the autopsy photos? Yes. Did you question her when she said that she only poked him with the bat? No. Not in any of your nine visits? Um, did I question her about whether... Can you just repeat the question? I want to make sure I'm answering it correctly. Okay. Um, did you ever, um, in considering the autopsy report and the autopsy photographs that you reviewed... Yes. When she said that she nudged or poked with the baseball bat, did you ever question her about that, um, given the severity of his injuries? So to answer correctly, I did question her about say? how she used the bat. Okay. And she reiterated that she poked and she gestured what she meant. So I did question her about that. And did you have any questions about that history she relayed to you, given the other evidence in this case that you reviewed? Um, just in contrast to the interrogation video. So that... You don't... It didn't... Contrast to the autopsy photographs or report. Judge, I object. Approach. You may proceed. Did she indicate all this nudging and, or poking with the bat was done while he was inside the suitcase? Yes. She never told you that there was any nudging or poking with the bat when he's outside the suitcase? All right. She indicated that um, she ended up flipping the suitcase over face down? That's right. Did she tell you about... Um, Mr. Torres calling his brother earlier that evening. No. Did she ever give you a, a history about a, a loud boom occurring inside of her townhouse that evening? No. And you never had the opportunity, obviously, to interview Mr. Torres about those things, correct? Of course not, no. No other questions? Any redirect examination? Rachel, Judge. Yes, sir. 
The state attorney talked to you about um, power and control, that an abusive partner will use power and control over the victim in a uh, intimate partner violence situation? Yes. Threatening someone's dogs, is that an example of someone using control? Yes. Taking car keys from the other party, is that an example of control? If they're withholding, yes. Taking a phone and withholding a phone? Yes. A debit card? Yes. Destroying a home, TVs, putting holes in the wall? Yes. Not helping pay the rent and other bills? So I would say that that could be withholding, that could go under coercive control of another person. What about violating a court order to have no contact with the person? Yes. That's all the questions. Thank you. Can this witness be released? As far as the state is concerned. Mr. Owens? Yeah. Thank you, doctor. Thank you. Just allow me a moment to check up. Collect all your stuff, ma'am. No worries. Sorry. No apologies yes. necessary. Uh, members of the jury, it's 443. We're going to go ahead and break for the evening. I'm going to ask you to be back here at 9 a.m. tomorrow morning. We'll continue with uh, evidence and testimony presentation by the defense, uh, and then we'll proceed accordingly thereafter. With that, members of the jury, again, I thank you for your time, your sacrifice, and your attentiveness in this matter, and we'll see you tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Well, if you made it all the way through the end of this, God bless you. I don't know how you did it. I pretty much just made this video for completeness sake. It wouldn't be fair for me to skip over the entire defense, even if it is completely ridiculous. Anyway, let's move on to day five. It's supposed to get really interesting. I'll see you soon. Y'all can be completed. Thank you. Anything else we need to sh discuss state before we go into recess today? Defense, anything else? No, sir. All right, we'll see you all tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Thank you very much. Court's off the record.